Introduction to Revolt in the Desert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Introduction Arabs could be swung on an idea as on a cord. For the unpledged allegiance of their minds made them obedient servants. None of them would escape the bond till success had come, and with it responsibility and duty and engagements. Then the idea was gone and the work ended, in ruins. Without a creed, they could be taken to the four corners of the world, but not to heaven, by being shown the riches of earth and the pleasures of it. But if on the road, led in this fashion, they met the prophet of an idea who had nowhere to lay his head and who depended for his food on charity or birds, then they would all leave their wealth for his inspiration. They were incorrigibly children of the idea, feckless and colorblind, to whom body and spirit were forever and inevitably opposed. Their mind was strange and dark, full of depressions and exaltations, lacking in rule but with more of ardor and more fertile in belief than any other in the world. They were a people of starts, for whom the abstract was the strongest motive, the process of infinite courage and variety, and the end nothing. They were as unstable as water, and like water would perhaps finally prevail. Since the dawn of life, in successive waves they had been dashing themselves against the coasts of flesh. Each wave was broken, but like the sea wore away ever so little of the granite on which it failed, and some day, ages yet, might roll unchecked over the place where the material world had been, and God would move upon the face of those waters. One such wave, and not the least, I raised and rolled before the breath of an idea, till it reached its crest and toppled over and fell at Damascus. The wash of that wave, thrown back by the resistance of vested things, Will provide the matter of the following wave, when in fullness of time the sea shall be raised once more. The strange and still mysterious figure of T. E. Lawrence has become, if not the best known, certainly one of the most famous in all the small gallery of true heroes of the war. An unimpressive, rather studious young man of twenty-six. He was rejected in the opening days of the war as physically unfit for military service. The authorities who rejected him can be forgiven, for not even Lawrence himself had guessed that he added to the unusual combination of archaeologist, philosopher, diplomat, and student of military affairs, the genius of a surpassing leader of irregular cavalry. After his failure to enlist, his knowledge of Arabic and the Arabian peoples brought him a commission as a subaltern in the intelligence service of the British command at Cairo. For his subsequent single-handed organization and leadership of the Arab revolt, through two years of bitter and weird adventure, in an atmosphere of incredible romance and under a veil of profound secrecy, the authorities were not to blame. It was his own masterpiece, and it was one of the miracles of the war. In 1914, T. E. Lawrence was serving as a more or less unnoticed assistant in the British Museum's excavation of Karakamesh on the Euphrates. Under the appearance of a brilliant and somewhat eccentric student of archaeology, he concealed a lively initiative, a sympathetic understanding of the country, and a relationship to more than one soldier prominent in British history, including, it is supposed, a Sir Robert Lawrence, who fought as a crusader under Richard Coeur de Lyon. Casual travellers found him unobtrusively digging Hittite remains out of the banks of the Euphrates. He left them reassured by his tactfulness with the Arab labourers as to the future of the British Empire. He knew the Near East intimately. His first direct knowledge of the complicated peoples of Arabia had been gained while he was still an undergraduate at Oxford, when he is said to have undertaken alone and in native dress, a two-year expedition among the tribes behind Syria, in order to gather material for his thesis on the military history of the Crusades. Such experience placed him obviously in the direct line of those remarkable British Orientalists like Doughty and Burton, have done so much to enrich British letters. It could hardly have been anticipated 
that it was preparing him for the very different and more romantic achievements in reckless leadership and masterful strategy which are described in these pages lawrence was not the author of the revolt his was the more difficult and also more dangerous task of being its inspiration a subaltern officer with no respect for his superiors with a sensitive and vigorous mind undisturbed either by military regulations or a desire for glory and with a scholarly taste in reading he was clearly an unexpected figure among the soldiery and camp followers at cairo since then he has allowed very little to be known of himself after his triumph in syria the famous guerrilla leader who nevertheless remained an ethnological expert served in the british peace delegation at versailles and was later a member of a special commission on near eastern affairs headed by the colonial secretary but an almost passionate dislike of notoriety and a seemingly deliberate eccentricity had continued to conceal his character and he is now february 1927 actually serving as a private soldier in the british army while the mists of a gathering legend have cloaked him in the obscurity of an almost mythological hero however in 1919 he wrote out in a 400,000 word book the whole bitter account of his adventure and of his disappointment over the conclusion which the peace conference seemed to put to it he left the book together with some of his notes and many photographs in a handbag in the reading railway station a few minutes later it had disappeared there was a flurry of rumor to the effect that it had been stolen by high authorities subsequently it has seemed more likely that the bag was taken by a casual sneak thief but lawrence at any rate sat down with an heroic effort of memory to rewrite the account he never intended it however for publication he had it printed on a newspaper press in oxford in an edition limited characteristically to eight copies of which three in what seems almost an excess of reticence were afterward destroyed of all the honors that an astonished government tried to force upon him the wartime rank of lieutenant colonel was the only one which he accepted and that largely because of the necessity for maintaining his status with the arabs the latter called him simply al orance or else by the more picturesque title of wrecker of engines the titles which the newspapers afterwards invented only annoyed him and not long ago the astonishing discovery was made that he had enlisted under an assumed name in the royal air force presumably to avoid attention there was of course another wave of notoriety and it is understood that he is now occupying the even less explicable position of a private in the tank corps the rewritten book with which lawrence himself was never quite satisfied was a purely personal record his impregnable reticence was however broken down to the extent of allowing a lengthy abridgment for publication by a friendly man of letters the book in its present form opens abruptly with lawrence's arrival with the arabian armies long after he had taken up along with others of the more brilliant younger men in the intelligence service at cairo the enthusiastic advocacy of the arabian revolt at the very outset of the war british diplomacy had remembered the unrest among the arab-speaking populations of turkey and its possible value in the defense of the suez canal a revolutionary movement fostered both by powerful secret societies and the repressive measures of the turks had been growing ever since the young turk revolution of 1908 it included many high civil and military officers of the turkish government while a third of the turkish army was arabic speaking and consequently disaffected even before turkey declared war sir henry mcmahon the representative of british civil power in egypt had written to hussein the grand sharif of mecca to promise british support for the independence of the arabs the secret societies did not agree that the allies cause against the central powers was identical with the arabs cause against turkey many of their members were still loyally commanding turkish troops at the end of the war and a doubt among the arabs as to the disinterestedness of the british explains many of lawrence's later difficulties the arabs however did plan a revolution on their own account under the banner of hussein and his four sons but it came to nothing meanwhile lawrence had taken up his modest duties in the intelligence service at cairo i had been many years he has said going up and down the semitic east before the war learning the manners of the villagers and tribesmen and citizens of syria and mesopotamia my poverty had constrained me to mix with the humbler classes though seldom met by european travelers 
and thus my experiences gave me an unusual angle of view, which enabled me to understand and think for the ignorant many as well as for the more enlightened whose rare opinions mattered, not so much for the day as for the morrow. In addition, I had seen something of the political forces working in the minds of the Middle East, and especially had noted everywhere sure signs of the decay of imperial Turkey. There were other archaeologists, orientalists, and younger experts of the political service, who, although wearing the unfamiliar uniforms of the army and navy, believed in the Arabian revolt as much for the sake of the Arabs as for the sake of the Allies. Lawrence was united with them in their interest in Sir Henry McMahon's correspondence with Hussein, although the more orthodox minds among the military found it difficult to understand such unconventional methods of warfare. As Lawrence adds, we called ourselves intrusive as a band, for we meant to break into the accepted halls of English foreign policy and build a new people in the East, despite the rails laid down for us by our ancestors. Therefore, from our hybrid intelligence office in Cairo, a jangling place, which for its incessant bells and bustle and running to and fro was likened by Aubrey Herbert to an oriental railway station, we began to work upon all our chiefs, far and near. It is a process of which chiefs seldom approve, but Sir Henry continued both his correspondence and his promises. The long agony of the Dardanelles was played out and ended. The British came to disaster at Kut el Amara, and the Turks were as close across the Suez Canal as ever. But in the summer of 1916, Sir Henry triumphed, and at the beginning of June, Hussein proclaimed the revolt of the Arab people, with British money and support. Both Jeddah and Mecca fell in the first rush of the Sharifian armies. But Faisal's attack upon Medina, the Turkish strong point at the end of the Hejaz railway, failed, and the revolt began to go rather precariously astray amid the simplicities of Arab patriotism and the complex departmental and international jealousies at Cairo. The military authorities still seemed incapable of grasping the value of a war started by the civilians, and a staff perturbed by the eccentric brilliancy of an intelligence service made up of experts began to show tendencies towards suppressing them. Sir Henry was recalled to England, and the Sharifian forces, led by Hussein's son Faisal and his three brothers, Ali, Abdullah, and Zaid got neither the supplies nor the advice which they needed. Lawrence, he was only 28 years old, had never regarded himself as a soldier. He liked his work of making maps and running a secret Arab newspaper, and he felt it meanness in him to pretend to be a man of action. Yet his Arab revolt was in serious difficulties. The Turks had sent out a formal attacking column from Medina, and the Arab levies were in danger of being jammed by the inapplicable principles of orthodox war, into the area around Mecca, instead of using their dash and mobility in the irregular combat for which they were supremely fitted. Meanwhile, Lawrence found himself in danger of being politely eliminated as an upstart, while other men ruined the plans for which he was largely responsible. His reply was first to make himself as obnoxious as possible to his military superiors, and then to ask for leave. It was granted with alacrity, in the hope that he could be gently put out of the way on his return. But he did not intend to be put out of the way. He boarded a naval vessel on the way down the Red Sea, ostensibly as a joyride with Sir Ronald Storrs, another of the intrusives who was making an official trip to Jeddah. He was without authority or passes, and Faisal, the principal commander, was in the interior from which as a Christian he was debarred by order but it was his precocious intention to see what he, a staff captain on leave, could do for the confused armies of Arabia. Storrs and I then marched off together happily. In the east, they swore that by three sides was the decent way across a square, and my trick to escape was in this sense oriental. But I justified myself by my confidence in the final success of the Arab revolt, if properly advised. I had been a mover in its beginning. My hopes lay in it. The fatalistic subordination of a professional soldier, intrigue being unknown in the British Army, would have made a proper officer sit down and watch his plan of campaign wrecked by men who thought nothing of it, and to whose spirit it made no appeal. Non novus domini. Forward. This book, written in 1919, was printed on a newspaper press in Oxford shortly after, not for publication, 
but as a convenience to myself and friends. Some of them asked for copies of their own, and from that demand gradually grew the idea of a richly produced edition, with many portrait drawings, to be published by subscription at a stiff price. The stiff price, though it covered the cost of printing, was not stiff enough to pay the artists adequately. Some of the richer artists agreed to work for nominal fees, and I raised money to pay the others by selling to Jonathan Cape the right to bring out this abridgment. It amounts to less than half of the original text, which occupied the reading hours of my friends for months. But half a calamity is better than a whole one, and this fairly represents all sides of the story. If I am asked why I have abridged an unsatisfactory book, instead of recasting it as a history, I must plead that to do so nice a job in the barracks which have been my home since 1922 would need a degree of concentration amounting in an airman to moroseness and an interest in the subject which was exhausted long ago in the actual experience of it. T. E. L. End of Introduction Chapter 1 of Revolt in the Desert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter 1. Stores Goes to Jidda. When at last we anchored in Jidda's outer harbour, off the white town hung between the blazing sky and its reflection in the mirage which swept and rolled over the wide lagoon. Then the heat of Arabia came out like a drawn sword and struck us speechless. It was a midday of October of 1916, and the noon sun had like moonlight put to sleep the colors. There were only lights and shadows, the white houses and black gaps of streets. In front, the pallid luster of the haze shimmering upon the inner harbor Behind, the dazzle of league after league of featureless sand, running up to an edge of low hills, faintly suggested in the faraway mist of heat. Just north of Jidda was a second group of black-white buildings, moving up and down like pistons in the mirage, as the ship rolled at anchor and the intermittent wind shifted the heat waves in the air. Colonel Wilson, British representative with the new Arab state, had sent his launch to meet us, and we had to go ashore to learn the reality of the men levitating in that mirage. We walked past the white masonry of the still-building water gate and through the oppressive alley of the food market on our way to the consulate. In the air, from the men to the dates and back to the meat, squadrons of flies like particles of dust danced up and down the sun shafts which stabbed into the darkest corners of the booths, through torn places in the wood and sackcloth awnings overhead. The atmosphere was like a bath. We reached the consulate, and there in a shaded room with an open lattice behind him sat Wilson, prepared to welcome the sea breeze, which had lagged these last few days. He told us that Sharif Abdullah, second son of Hussein, Grand Sharif of Mecca, was just then entering the town. Ronald Storrs and myself had come down the Red Sea from Cairo to meet Abdullah, it was auspicious that we had arrived together. For Mecca, the Sharifian capital, was inaccessible to Christians, and such business as stores could not well be transacted by telephone. My presence must be put down to joyriding. But stores, Oriental secretary to the residency in Cairo, was the confidential assistant of Sir Henry McMahon in all the delicate negotiations with the Sharif of Mecca. The happy union of his local knowledge with the experience and acumen of Sir Henry, and the sympathy of Clayton, so impressed the Sharif that that very difficult person accepted their guarded undertakings as sufficient assurance for beginning his revolt against Turkey, and kept faith with the British authorities throughout a war history which teemed with doubtful and hazardous situations. Sir Henry was England's right-hand man in the Middle East till the Arab revolt was an established event. Sir Mark Sykes was the left hand, and if the Foreign Office had kept itself and its hands mutually informed, our reputation for honesty would not have suffered as it did. Abdullah, on a white mare, came to us softly, with a bevy of richly armed slaves on foot about him, 
through the silent, respectful salutes of the town. He was flushed with his success at Taif, and happy. I was seeing him for the first time, while Storrs was an old friend and on the best of terms. Yet before long, as they spoke together, I began to suspect him of a constant cheerfulness. His eyes had a confirmed twinkle, and though only thirty-five he was putting on flesh. It might be due to too much laughter. He jested with all comers in most easy fashion. Yet when we fell into serious talk, the veil of humor seemed to fade away as he chose his words and argued shrewdly. Of course he was in discussion with stores, who demanded a high standard from his opponent. I was playing for effect, watching, criticizing him. The Sharif's rebellion had been unsatisfactory for the last few months. Standing still, which, within a regular war, was the prelude to disaster. And my suspicion was that its lack was leadership. Not intellect, nor judgment, nor political wisdom, but the flame of enthusiasm that would set the desert on fire. My visit was mainly to find the yet unknown master spirit of the affair, and measure his capacity to carry the revolt to the goal I had conceived for it. As our conversation continued, I became more and more sure that Abdullah was too balanced, too cool, too humorous to be a prophet, especially the armed prophet who, if history be true, succeeded in revolutions. His value would come perhaps in the peace after success. Storrs brought me into the discussion by asking his views on the state of the campaign. Abdullah at once grew serious and said that he wanted to urge upon the British their immediate and very personal concern in the matter, which he tabulated so. By our neglect to cut the Hejaz railway, the Turks had been able to collect transport and supplies for the reinforcement of Medina. Faisal had been driven back from the town, and the enemy was preparing a mobile column of all arms for an advance on Rabeg. The Arabs in the hills across their road were by our neglect too weak in supplies, machine guns, and artillery to defend them long. Hussein Mabereg, chief of the Rabeg Harb, had joined the Turks. If the Medina column advanced, the Harb would join it. It would only remain for his father to put himself at the head of his own people of Mecca, and to die fighting before the holy city. At this moment the telephone rang. The Grand Sharif wanted to speak to Abdullah. He was told of the point our conversation had reached, and at once confirmed that he would so act in the extremity. The Turks would enter Mecca over his dead body. The telephone rang off, and Abdullah, smiling a little, asked, to prevent such a disaster, that a British brigade, if possible of Muslim troops, be kept at Suez, with transport to Russia to Rabeg as soon as the Turks debouched from Medina in their attack. What did we think of the proposal? I said that I would represent his views to Egypt, but that the British were reluctant to spare troops from the vital defense of Egypt, though he was not to imagine that the canal was in any danger from the Turks. And still more, to send Christians to defend the people of the holy city against their enemies. As some Muslims in India, who considered the Turkish government had an imprescriptible right to the Haramean, would misrepresent our motives and action. I thought that I might perhaps urge his opinions more powerfully if I was able to report on the Rabeg question in the light of my own knowledge of the position and local feeling. I would also like to see Faisal and to talk over with him his needs and the prospects of a prolonged defense of his hills by the tribesmen if we strengthen them materially. I would like to ride from Rabeg up the Sultani Road toward Medina as far as Faisal's camp. Stores then came in and supported me with all his might, urging the vital importance of full and early information from a trained observer for the British commander-in-chief in Egypt. Abdullah went to the telephone and tried to get his father's consent to my going up country. The Sharif viewed the proposal with grave distrust. Abdullah argued the point, made some advantage, and transferred the mouthpiece to Stores who turned all his diplomacy on the old man. Stores in full blast was a delight to listen to in the mere matter of Arabic speech, and also a lesson to every Englishman alive of how to deal with suspicious or unwilling Orientals. It was nearly impossible to resist him for more than a few minutes, and in this case also he had his way. The Sharif asked again for Abdullah, and authorized him to write to Ali, and suggest that if he thought fit, and if conditions were normal, I might be allowed to visit Faisal. 
and Abdullah, under Storr's influence, transformed this guarded message into direct written instructions to Ali to mount me as well and as quickly as possible, and convey me by sure hand to Faisal's camp. This being all I wanted and half what Storr's wanted, we adjourned for lunch. Jetta had pleased us on our way to the consulate. So after lunch, when it was a little cooler, or at least when the sun was not so high, we wandered out to see the sights under the guidance of Young, Wilson's assistant, a man who found good in many old things, but little good in things now being made. It was indeed a remarkable town. The streets were alleys, wood roofed in the main bazaar, but elsewhere open to the sky in the little gap between the tops of the lofty white-walled houses. These were built four or five stories high, of coral rag tied with square beams and decorated by wide bow windows running from ground to roof in grey wooden panels. There was no glass in Jeddah, but a profusion of good lattices and some very delicate shallow chiseling on the panels of window casings. The doors were heavy two-leaf slabs of teak wood, deeply carved, often with wickets in them, and they had rich hinges and ring knockers of hammered iron. There was much molded or cut plastering, and on the older houses, fine stone heads and jams to the windows looking on the inner courts. The style of architecture was like crazy Elizabethan half-timber work, in the elaborate Cheshire fashion, but gone gimcrack to an incredible degree. House fronts were fretted, pierced, and pargeted till they looked as though cut out of cardboard for romantic stage setting. Every story jutted, every window leaned one way or other, often the very walls sloped. It was like a dead city, so clean underfoot and so quiet. Its winding, even streets were floored with damp sand solidified by time and as silent to the tread as any carpet. The lattices and wall returns deadened all reverberation of voice. There were no carts, nor any streets wide enough for carts, no shod animals, no bustle anywhere. Everything was hushed, strained, even furtive. The doors of houses shut softly as we passed. There were no loud dogs, no crying children. Indeed, except in the bazaar, still half asleep, there were few wayfarers of any kind. And the rare people we did meet, all thin and as it were wasted by disease, with scarred, hairless faces and screwed up eyes, slipped past us quickly and cautiously, not looking at us. Their skimp white robes, shaven poles with little skull caps, red cotton shoulder shawls and bare feet were so same as to be almost a uniform. The atmosphere was oppressive, deadly. There seemed no life in it. It was not burning hot, but held a moisture and sense of great age and exhaustion, such as seemed to belong to no other place. Not a passion of smells like Smyrna, Naples, or Marseille, but a feeling of long use, of the exhalations of many people, of continued bath heat and sweat. One would say that for years Jidda had not been swept through by a firm breeze, that its streets kept their air from year's end to year's end, from the day they were built for so long as the houses should endure. There was nothing in the bazaars to buy. In the evening, the telephone rang, and the Sharif called stores to the instrument. He asked if we would not like to listen to his band. Stores, in astonishment, asked what band, and congratulated His Holiness on having advanced so far towards urbanity. The Sharif explained that the headquarters of the Hejaz command under the Turks had had a brass band, which played each night to the governor-general. And when the governor-general was captured by Abdullah at Taif, his band was captured with him. The other prisoners were sent to Egypt for internment, but the band was accepted. It was held in Mecca to give music to the victors. Sharif Hussein laid his receiver on the table of his reception hall, and we, called solemnly one by one to the telephone, heard the band in the palace of Mecca, 45 miles away. Stores expressed the general gratification, and the Sharif, increasing his bounty, replied that the band should be sent down by forced march to Jeddah to play in our courtyard also. And, said he, you may then do me the pleasure of ringing me up from your end, that I may share your satisfaction. Next day, Stores visited Abdullah in his tent out by Eve's tomb and together they inspected the hospital, the barracks, the town offices, 
and partook of the hospitality of the mayor and the governor. In the intervals of duty they talked about money, and the Sharif's title, and his relations with the other princes of Arabia, and the general course of the war. All the commonplaces that should pass between envoys of two governments. It was tedious, and for the most part I held myself excused, as I had made up my mind that Abdullah was not the necessary leader. The company of Sharif Shakir, Abdullah's cousin and best friend, proved more exciting. Shakir, a grandee of Taif, had been playmate from boyhood of the Sharif's sons, and he played yet, publicly and privately, in the enormous fashion which his wealth and courage and self-confidence united to make possible. Never before had I met so sudden a man, passing instantly from a frozen dignity to a whirlwind of jesting life, strident, intense, athletic, magnificent. His face, eaten away by smallpox so that hardly a hair root remained, mirrored like the window of a speeding car at once what passed without and within it. Abdullah had commanded at the siege of Taif, but it was Shakir who led the troops with a headlong dash that defeated his own purpose by excess of danger. The Arabs dared not support him into the very breach of the wall, and Shakir had to return, alone and unscathed, cursing his fellows, laughing at them, and jeering wildly at the discomfited enemy, whose revenge was to pour petrol over his great house and burn it with its famous library of Arabic manuscripts. That evening, Abdullah came to dine with Colonel Wilson. We received him in the courtyard on the house steps. Behind him were his brilliant household servants and slaves, and behind them a pale crew of bearded, emaciated men with woebegone faces, wearing tatters of military uniform and carrying tarnished brass instruments of music. Abdullah waved his hand towards them and crowed with delight, My band! We sat them on benches in the forecourt, and Wilson sent them cigarettes while we went up to the dining room where the shuttered balcony was open right out, hungrily for a sea breeze. As we sat down, the band under the guns and swords of Abdullah's retainers began, each instrument apart, to play heartbroken Turkish airs. Our ears ached with noise, but Abdullah beamed. We got tired of Turkish music and asked for German. An aide-de-camp stepped out on the balcony and called down to the bandsmen in Turkish to play us something foreign. They struck shakily into Deutschland über alles, just as the Sharif came to his telephone in Mecca to listen to the music of our feast. We asked for more German music, and they played Ein Festeburg. Then, in the midst, they died away into flabby discords of drums. The parchment had stretched in the damp air of Jidda. They cried for fire, and Wilson's servants and Abdullah's bodyguard brought them piles of straw and packing cases. They warmed the drums, turning them round and round before the blaze, and then broke into what they said was the hymn of hate, though no one could recognize a European progression in it all. Someone turned to Abdullah and said, It is a death march. Abdullah's eyes widened, but stores who spoke in quickly to the rescue turned the moment to laughter, and we sent out rewards with the leavings of the feast to the sorrowful musicians, who could take no pleasure in our praises, but begged to be sent home. End of Chapter 1Chapter 2 of Revolt in the Desert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter 2 Riding Up to Faisal. Next morning, I left Jidda by ship for Rabig, the headquarters of Sharif Ali, Abdullah's elder brother. When Ali received his father's order to send me at once up to Faisal, he was staggered, but could not help himself. So he prepared for me his own splendid riding camel, saddled with his own saddle, and hung with luxurious housings and cushions of nedged leatherwork, pieced and inlaid in various colors, with plated fringes and nets embroidered with metal tissues. As a trustworthy man, he chose out Tafes, a Hawizim Harb tribesman, with his son, 
to guide me to Faisal's camp. Ali would not let me start till after sunset, lest any of his followers see me leave the camp. He kept my journey a secret even from his slaves, and gave me an Arab cloak and headcloth to wrap round myself and my uniform, that I might present a proper silhouette in the dark upon my camel. I had no food with me, so we instructed Tafas to get something to eat at Bir al Sheikh, the first settlement, some sixty miles out, and charged him most stringently to keep me from questioning and curiosity on the way, and to avoid all camps and encounters. We marched through the palm groves, which lay like a girdle about the scattered houses of Rabig village, and then out under the stars along the Tehema, the sandy and featureless strip of desert bordering the western coast of Arabia, between sea beach and littoral hills, for hundreds of monotonous miles. In daytime, this low plain was insufferably hot, and its waterless character made it a forbidding road. Yet it was inevitable, since the more fruitful hills were too rugged to afford passage north and south for loaded animals. The cool of the night was pleasant after the day of checks and discussions which had so dragged at Rabig. Tafas led on without speaking, and the camels went silently over the soft flat sand. My thoughts as we went were how this was the pilgrim road, down which for uncounted generations the people of the north had come to visit the holy city, bearing with them gifts of faith for the shrine. And it seemed that the Arab revolt might be in a sense a return pilgrimage, to take back to the north, to Syria, an ideal for an ideal, a belief in liberty for their past belief in a revelation. We endured for some hours, without variety except at times when the camels plunged and strained a little, and the saddles creaked. Indications that the soft plain had merged into beds of drift sand, dotted with tiny scrub, and therefore uneven going, since the plants collected little mounds about their roots, and the eddies of the sea winds scooped hollows in the intervening spaces. Camels appeared not sure-footed in the dark, and the starlit sand carried little shadow, so that hummocks and holes were difficult to see. Before midnight we halted, and I rolled myself tighter in my cloak, and chose a hollow of my own size and shape, and slept well in it till nearly dawn. As soon as he felt the air growing chill with the coming change, Tafis got up, and two minutes later we were swinging forward again. An hour after, and it grew bright, as we climbed a low neck of lava drowned nearly to the top with blown sand. This joined a small flow near the shore to the main Hejaz lava field, whose western edge ran up upon our right hand and caused the coast road to lie where it did. The neck was stony but brief. On each side the blue lava humped itself into low shoulders, from which, so Tafis said, it was possible to see ships sailing on the sea. Pilgrims had built cairns here by the road. Sometimes they were individual piles, of just three stones set up one above the other. Sometimes they were common heaps, to which any disposed passer-by might add his stone, not reasonably, nor with known motive, but because others did, and perhaps they knew. Beyond the ridge, the path descended into a broad open place, the Mastura, or plain by which Wadi Fiora flowed into the sea. Seeming its surface with innumerable interwoven channels of loose stone, a few inches deep, were the beds of the flood water, on those rare occasions when there was rain in the Tarif and the courses raged like rivers to the sea. The delta here was about six miles wide. Down some part of it, water flowed for an hour or two, or even for a day or two, every so many years. Underground there was plenty of moisture, protected by the overlying sand from the sun heat, and thorn trees and loose scrub profited by it and flourished. Some of the trunks were a foot through, their height might be twenty feet. The trees and bushes stood somewhat apart in clusters, their lower branches cropped by the hungry camels. So they looked cared for and had a premeditated air, which felt strange in the wilderness, more especially as the Tehama hitherto had been a sober bareness. In the early sunlight, we lifted our camels to a steady trot across the good going of these shingle beds among the trees, making for Mastura Well, the first stage out from Rabeg on the pilgrim road. 
There we would water and halt a little. My camel was a delight to me, for I had not been on such an animal before. There were no good camels in Egypt, and those of the Sinai Desert, while hardy and strong, were not taught to pace fair and softly and swiftly, like these rich mounts of the Arabian princes. Yet her accomplishments were today largely wasted, since they were reserved for riders who had the knack and asked for them, and not for me who expected to be carried and had no sense of how to ride. It was easy to sit on a camel's back without falling off, but very difficult to understand and get the best out of her so as to do long journeys without fatiguing either rider or beast. Taphus gave me hints as we went. Indeed, it was one of the few subjects on which he would speak. His orders to preserve me from contact with the world seemed to have closed even his mouth. A pity, for his dialect interested me. Quite close to the north bank of the Mastura, we found the well. Beside it were some decayed stone walls which had been a hut, and opposite it some little shelters of branches and palm leaves, under which a few Bedouin were sitting. We did not greet them. Instead, Taphus turned across to the ruinous walls and dismounted, and I sat in their shade while he and Abdullah watered the animals, and drew a drink for themselves and for me. The well was old and broad, with good stone stenning and a strong coping round the top. It was about twenty feet deep, and for the convenience of travellers without ropes, like ourselves, a square chimney had been contrived in the masonry, with foot and handholds in the corners, so that a man might descend to the water and fill his goatskin. Idle hands had flung so many stones down the shaft that half the bottom of the well was choked and the water not abundant. Abdullah tied his flowing sleeves about his shoulders, tucked his gown under his cartridge belt, and clambered nimbly down and up, bringing each time four or five gallons which he poured for our camels into a stone trough beside the well. They drank about five gallons each, for they had been watered at Rabeg a day back. Then we let the moon about a little while we sat in peace, breathing the light wind coming off the sea. Abdullah smoked a cigarette as reward for his exertions. Some herb came up, driving a large herd of brood camels, and began to water them, having sent one man down the well to fill their large leather bucket which the others drew up hand over hand with a loud staccato chant. As we watched them, two riders, trotting light and fast on thoroughbred camels, drew towards us from the north. Both were young. One was dressed in rich cashmere robes and heavy silk embroidered headcloth. The other was plainer, in white cotton, with a red cotton headdress. They halted beside the well, and the more splendid one slipped gracefully to the ground without kneeling his camel, and threw his halter to his companion, saying carelessly, Water them while I go over there and rest. Then he strolled across and sat down under our wall, after glancing at us with affected unconcern. He offered a cigarette, just rolled and licked, saying, Your presence is from Syria? I parried politely, suggesting that he was from Mecca, to which he likewise made no direct reply. We spoke a little of the war and of the leanness of the Harb she-camels. Meanwhile, the other rider stood by, vacantly holding the halters, waiting perhaps for the Harb to finish watering their herd before taking his turn. The young lord cried, What is it, Mustafa? Water them at once. The servant came up to say dismally, They will not let me. God's mercy, shouted his master furiously, as he scrambled to his feet and hit the unfortunate Mustafa three or four sharp blows about the head and shoulders with his riding stick. Go and ask them. Mustafa looked hurt, astonished and angry, as though he would hit back, but thought better of it, and ran to the well. The Harb, shocked, in pity made a place for him and let his two camels drink from their water trough. They whispered, Who is he? and Mustafa said, Our Lord's cousin from Mecca. At once they ran and untied a bundle from one of their saddles, and spread from it before the two riding camels, fodder of the green leaves and buds of the thorn trees. They were used to gather this by striking the low bushes with a heavy staff, till the broken tips of the branches rained down on a cloth stretched over the ground beneath. 
The young Sharif watched them contentedly. When his camel had fed, he climbed slowly and without apparent effort up its neck and into the saddle, where he settled himself leisurely and took an unctuous farewell of us, asking God to requite the Arabs bountifully. They wished him a good journey, and he started southward, while Abdullah brought our camels and we went off northward. Ten minutes later I heard a chuckle from old Tafas and saw wrinkles of delight between his grizzled beard and moustache. "'What is upon you, Tafas?' said I. "'My lord, you saw those two riders at the well. "'The Sharif and his servant?' "'Yes, but they were Sharif Ali ibn al-Husayn of Modig "'and his cousin Sharif Mosin, lords of the Harith, "'who were blood enemies of the Masra. "'They feared that they would be delayed or driven off the water "'if the Arabs knew them, "'so they pretended to be master and servant from Mecca. "'Did you see how Mosin raged when Ali beat him? "'Ali is a devil.' While only eleven years old, he escaped from his father's house to his uncle, a robber of pilgrims by trade, and with him he lived by his hands for many months till his father caught him. He was with our Lord Faisal from the first day's battle in Medina, and led the Atiba in the plains round Ar and Birder Wish. It was all camel fighting, and Ali would have no man with him who could not do as he did, run beside his camel and leap with one hand into the saddle carrying his rifle. The children of Harith are children of battle. For the first time, the old man's mouth was full of words. While he spoke, we scoured along the dazzling plain, now nearly bare of trees, and turning slowly softer underfoot. At first it had been grey shingle, packed like gravel. Then the sand increased and the stones grew rarer, till we could distinguish the colors of the separate flakes. Porphyry, green schist, basalt. At last it was nearly pure white sand, under which lay a harder stratum. Such going was like a pile carpet for a camel's running. The particles of sand were clean and polished, and caught the blaze of sun like little diamonds in a reflection so fierce that after a while I could not endure it. I frowned hard and pulled the headcloth forward in a peak over my eyes, and beneath them too like a beaver trying to shut out the heat which rose in glassy waves off the ground and beat up against my face. Eighty miles in front of us, the huge peak of Rudwa behind Yembo was looming and fading in the dazzle of vapor which hid its foot. Quite near in, the plain little shapeless hills seemed to block the way. To our right, the steep ridge of Beni Ayub, toothed and narrow like a saw blade, fell away on the north into a blue series of smaller hills soft in character, behind which lofty range after range in a jagged stairway. Red now the sun grew low, climbed up to the towering central mass of Jebel Sub with its fantastic granite spires. A little later we turned to the right off the pilgrim road and took a shortcut across gradually rising ground of flat basalt ridges, buried in sand till only their topmost pile showed above the surface. Along this we held our way till sunset, when we came into sight of the hamlet of Bir al-Sheikh. In the first dark, as the supper fires were lighted, we rode down its wide open street and halted. Tafes went into one of the twenty miserable huts, and in a few whispered words and long silences bought flour, of which with water he needed a dough cake two inches thick and eight inches across. This he buried in the ashes of a brushwood fire, provided for him by a soub woman, whom he seemed to know. When the cake was warmed, he drew it out of the fire and clapped it to shake off the dust. Then we shared it together, while Abdullah went away to buy himself tobacco. They told me the place had two stone-lined wells at the bottom of the southward slope, but I felt disinclined to go and look at them, for the long ride that day had tired my unaccustomed muscles and the heat of the plain had been painful. My skin was blistered by it, and my eyes ached with the glare of light striking up at a sharp angle from the silver sand and from the shining pebbles. The last two years I had spent in Cairo, at a desk all day, or thinking hard in a little overcrowded office full of distracting noises, with a hundred rushing things to say, but no bodily need except to come and go each day between office and hotel. In consequence, the novelty of this change was severe, 
since time had not been given me gradually to accustom myself to the pestilent beating of the Arabian sun and the long monotony of camel pacing. There was to be another stage tonight and a long day tomorrow before Faisal's camp would be reached. So I was grateful for the cooking and the marketing, which spent one hour, and for the second hour of rest after it, which we took by common consent. And sorry when it ended, and we remounted and rode in pitch darkness up valleys and down valleys, passing in and out of bands of air which were hot in the confined hollows, but fresh and stirring in the open places. The ground underfoot must have been sandy, because the silence of our passage hurt my straining ears, and smooth, for I was always falling asleep in the saddle, to wake a few seconds later suddenly and sickeningly, as I clutched by instinct at the saddle post to recover my balance, which had been thrown out by some irregular stride of the animal. It was too dark, and the forms of the country were too neutral to hold my heavy-lashed peering eyes. At length we stopped for good, long after midnight, and I was rolled up in my cloak and asleep in a most comfortable little sand grave before Taffas had done knee-haltering my camel. Three hours later we were on the move again, helped now by the last shining of the moon. We marched down Wadi Mared, the night of it dead, hot, silent, and on each side sharp-pointed hills standing up black and white in the exhausted air. There were many trees. Dawn finally came to us as we passed out of the narrows into a broad place, over whose flat floor an uneasy wind spanned circles capriciously in the dust. The day strengthened always, and now showed Bir Ibn Hassani just to our right. The trim settlement of absurd little houses, brown and white, holding together for security's sake, looked doll-like and more lonely than the desert, in the immense shadow of the dark precipice of Sub behind. While we watched it, hoping to see life at its doors, the sun was rushing up and the fretted cliffs, those thousands of feet above our heads, became outlined in hard refracted shafts of white light against the sky still sallow with the transient dawn. We rode across the great valley. A camel rider, garrulous and old, came out from the houses and jogged over to join us. He named himself Caliph, too friendly-like. His salutation came after a pause in a trite stream of chat, and when it was returned he tried to force us into conversation. However, Tafis grudged his company and gave him short answers. Caliph persisted, and finally, to improve his footing, bent down and burrowed in his saddle pouch till he found a small covered pot of enameled iron, containing a liberal portion of the staple of travel in the Hejaz. This was the unleavened dough cake of yesterday, but crumbled between the fingers while still warm, and moistened with liquid butter till its particles would fall apart only reluctantly. It was then sweetened for eating with ground sugar, and scooped up like damp sawdust and pressed pellets with the fingers. I ate a little, on this my first attempt, while Tafis and Abdullah played at it vigorously. So for his bounty, Caliph went half hungry. Deservedly, for it was thought effeminate by the Arabs to carry a provision of food for a little journey of one hundred miles. We were now fellows and the chat began again while Caliph told us about the last fighting, and a reverse Faisal had had the day before. It seemed he had been beaten out of the head of Wadi Safra, and was now at Hamra, only a little way in front of us. Or at least Caliph thought he was there. We might learn for sure in the next village on our road. The fighting had not been severe, but the few casualties were all among the tribesmen of Tafis and Caliph, and the names and hurts of each were told in order. We rode seven miles to a low watershed, crossed by a wall of granite slivers, now little more than a shapeless heap, but once no doubt a barrier. It ran from cliff to cliff, and even far up the hillsides, wherever the slopes were not too steep to climb. In the center, where the road passed, had been two small enclosures like pounds, I asked Caliph the purpose of the wall. He replied that he had been in Damascus and Constantinople and Cairo, and had many friends among the great men of Egypt. Did I know any of the English there? 
Kala seemed curious about my intentions and my history. He tried to trip me in Egyptian phrases. When I answered in the dialect of Aleppo, he spoke of prominent Syrians of his acquaintance. I knew them too, and he switched off into local politics, asking careful questions delicately and indirectly about the Sharif and his sons, and what I thought Faisal was going to do. I understood less of this than he, and parried inconsequentially. Tafis came to my rescue and changed the subject. Afterwards, we knew that Caliph was in Turkish pay, and used to send frequent reports of what came past Bir ibn Hassani for the Arab forces. We turned to the right, across another saddle, and then downhill for a few miles to a corner of tall cliffs. We rounded this and found ourselves suddenly in Wadi Safra, the valley of our seeking, and in the midst of Wasta, its largest village. Wasta seemed to be many nests of houses, clinging to the hillsides, each side the torrent bed on banks of alluvial soil, or standing on detritus islands between the various deep-swept channels whose sum made up the parent valley. Riding between two or three of these built-up islands, we made for the far bank of the valley. On our way was the main bed of the winter floods, a sweep of white shingle and boulders, quite flat. Down its middle, from palm grove on the one side to palm grove on the other, lay a reach of clear water, perhaps two hundred yards long and twelve feet wide, sand-bottomed and bordered on each brink by a ten-foot lawn of thick grass and flowers. On it, we halted a moment to let our camels put their heads down and drink their fill, and the relief of the grass to our eyes after the day-long hard glitter of the pebbles was so sudden that involuntarily I glanced up to see if a cloud had not covered the face of the sun. We rode up the stream to the garden, from which it ran sparkling in a stone-lined channel, and then we turned along the mud wall of the garden in the shadow of its palms, to another of the detached hamlets. Tafas led the way up its little street. The houses were so low that from our saddles we looked down upon their clay roofs. And near one of the larger houses, stopped and beat upon the door of an uncovered court. A slave opened to us, and we dismounted in privacy. Tafis haltered the camels, loosed their girths, and strewed before them green fodder from a fragrant pile beside the gate. Then he led me into the guest room of the house, a dark, clean little mud-brick place, roofed with half-palm logs under hammered earth. We sat down on the palm-leaf mat which ran along the dais, the day in the stifling valley had grown very hot, and gradually we lay back side by side. Then the hum of the bees in the gardens without, and of the flies hovering over our veiled faces within, lulled us into sleep. Before we awoke, a meal of bread and dates had been prepared for us by the people of the house. The dates were new, meltingly sweet and good, like none I had ever tasted. Afterwards we mounted again and rode up the clear slow rivulet till it was hidden within the palm gardens, behind their low boundary walls of sun-dried clay. In and out between the tree roots were dug little canals a foot or two deep, so contrived that the stream might be led into them from the stone channel, and each tree watered in its turn. The head of water was owned by the community, and shared out among the landowners for so many minutes or hours daily or weekly according to the traditional use. The water was a little brackish, as was needful for the best palms, but it was sweet enough in the wells of private water in the groves. These wells were very frequent, and found water three or four feet below the surface. Our way took us through the central village and its market street. There was little in the shops, and all the place felt decayed. A generation ago, Wasta was populous, they said by a thousand houses. But one day, there rolled a huge wall of water down Wadi Safra. The embankments of many palm gardens were breached, and the palm trees swept away. Some of the islands on which houses had stood for centuries were submerged, and the mud houses melted again back into mud, killing or drowning the unfortunate slaves within. The men could have been replaced, and the trees had the soil remained. But the gardens had been built up of earth carefully won from the normal freshets by years of labor, and this wave of water, eight feet deep, 
running in a race for three days, reduce the plots in its track to their primordial banks of stones. A little above Wasta, the valley widened somewhat to an average of perhaps four hundred yards, with a bed of fine shingle and sand, laid very smooth by the winter rains. The walls were of bare red and black rock, whose edges and ridges were sharp as knife blades and reflected the sun like metal. They made the freshness of the trees and grass seem luxurious. We now saw parties of Faisal soldiers and grazing herds of their saddle camels. Before we reached Hamra, every nook in the rocks or clump of trees was a bivouac. They cried cheery greetings to Tafas, who came to life again, waving back and calling to them, while he pressed on quickly to end his duty towards me. Hamra opened on our left. It seemed a village of about one hundred houses, buried in gardens among mounds of earth some twenty feet in height. We forded a little stream and went up a walled path between trees to the top of one of these mounds, where we made our camels kneel by the yard gate of a long, low house. Tafa said something to a slave who stood there with a silver-hilted sword in hand. He led me to an inner court, on whose further side, framed between the uprights of a black doorway, stood a white figure waiting tensely for me. I felt at first glance that this was the man I had come to Arabia to seek, the leader who would bring the Arab revolt to full glory. Faisal looked very tall and pillar-like, very slender in his long white silk robes and his brown headcloth bound with a brilliant scarlet and gold cord. His eyelids were dropped, and his black beard and colorless face were like a mask against the strange still watchfulness of his body. His hands were crossed in front of him on his dagger. I greeted him. He made way for me into the room, and sat down on his carpet near the door. As my eyes grew accustomed to the shade, they saw that the little room held many silent figures, looking at me or at Faisal steadily. He remained staring down at his hands, which were twisting slowly about his dagger. At last, he inquired softly how I had found the journey. I spoke of the heat, and he asked how long from Rabig, commenting that I had ridden fast for the season. And do you like our place here in Wadi Safra? Well, but it is far from Damascus. The word had fallen like a sword into their midst. There was a quiver. Then everybody present stiffened where he sat and held his breath for a silent minute. Some, perhaps, were dreaming of far-off success. Others may have thought it a reflection on their late defeat. Faisal at length lifted his eyes, smiling at me, and said, Praise be to God, there are Turks nearer us than that. We all smiled with him, and I rose and excused myself for the moment. End of chapter 2「Three of Revolt in the Desert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter 3. Faisal and his Levies. Under tall arcades of palms with ribbed and groin branches, in a soft meadow, I found the trim camp of Egyptian army soldiers with Nafi Bey, their Egyptian major, sent lately from the Sudan by Sir Reginald Wingate to help the Arab rebellion. They comprised a mountain battery and some machine guns. Nafi himself was an amiable fellow, kind and hospitable to me. Faisal was announced with Malud al Muklis the Arab zealot of Tekrit, who for rampant nationalism had been twice degraded in the Turkish army and had spent an exile of two years in the Nejed as a secretary with Ibn Rashid. He had commanded the Turkish cavalry before Shaiba and had been taken by us there. As soon as he heard of the rebellion of the Sharif, he had volunteered for him and had been the first regular officer to join Faisal. He was now nominally his ADC. Bitterly, he complained that they were in every way ill-equipped. This was the main cause of their present plight. They got 30,000 pounds a month from the Sharif, 
but little flour and rice, little barley, few rifles, insufficient ammunition, no machine guns, no mountain guns, no technical help, no information. I stopped Maulud there and said my coming was expressly to learn what they lacked and to report it, but that I could work with them only if they would explain to me their general situation. Faisal agreed and began to sketch to me the history of their revolt from its absolute beginning. The first rush on Medina had been a desperate business. The Arabs were ill-armed and short of ammunition, the Turks in great force. At the height of the crisis, the Beni Ali broke, and the Arabs were thrust out beyond the walls. The Turks then opened fire on them with their artillery, and the Arabs, unused to this new arm, became terrified. The Agail and Atiba got into safety and refused to move out again. Sections of Beni Ali tribesmen approached the Turkish command with an offer to surrender, if their villages were spared. Fakri played with them, and in the ensuing lull of hostility surrounded the Awali suburb with his troops, whom suddenly he ordered to carry it by assault and to massacre every living thing within its walls. Hundreds of the inhabitants were raped and butchered, the houses fired, and living and dead alike thrown back into the flames. Fakri and his men had served together and had learned the arts of both the slow and the fast kill upon the Armenians in the north. This bitter taste of the Turkish mode of war sent a shock across Arabia, for the first rule of Arab war was that women were inviolable. The second, that the lives and honor of children too young to fight with men were to be spared. The third, that property impossible to carry off should be left undamaged. The Arabs with Faisal perceived that they were opposed to new customs and fell back out of touch to gain time to readjust themselves. There could no longer be any question of submission. The sack of Awali had opened blood feud upon blood feud and put on them the duty of fighting to the end of their force. But it was plain now that it would be a long affair and that with muzzle-loading guns for soul weapons they could hardly expect to win. So they fell back from their level plains about Medina into the hills where they rested, while Ali and Faisal sent messenger after messenger down to Rabig, their sea base, to learn when fresh stores and money and arms might be expected. The revolt had begun haphazard on their father's explicit orders, and the old man, too independent to take his sons into his full confidence, had not worked out with them any arrangements for prolonging it. So the reply was only a little food. Later, some Japanese rifles, most of them broken, were received. Such barrels as were still whole were so foul that the two eager Arabs burst them on the first trial. No money was sent up at all. To take its place, Faisal filled a decent chest with stones, had it locked and corded carefully, guarded on each daily march by his own slaves, and introduced meticulously into his tent each night. By such theatricals, the brothers tried to hold a melting force. At last Ali went down to Rabig to inquire what was wrong with the organization. He found that Hussein Maberig, the local chief, had made up his mind that the Turks would be victorious. He had tried conclusions with them twice himself and had the worst of it, and accordingly decided theirs was the best cause to follow. As the stores for the Sharif were landed by the British, he appropriated them and stored them away secretly in his own houses. Ali made a demonstration and sent urgent messages for his half-brother Zaid to join him from Jeddah with reinforcements. Hussein, in fear, slipped off to the hills and outlaw. The two Sharifs took possession of his villages. In them they found great stores of arms and food enough for their armies for a month. The temptation of a spell of leisured ease was too much for them. They settled down in Rabig. This left Faisal alone up country, and he soon found himself isolated in a hollow situation, driven to depend upon his native resources. He bore it for a time, but in August took advantage of the visit of Colonel Wilson to the newly conquered Yembo to come down and give a full explanation of his urgent needs. Wilson was impressed with him and his story, and at once promised him a battery of mountain guns and some maxims to be handled by men and officers of the Egyptian army garrison in the Sudan. This explained the presence of Nafi Bey and his units.
the Arabs rejoiced when they came, and believed they were now equals of the Turk. But the four guns were twenty-year-old Krupps with a range of only three thousand yards, and their crews were not eager enough in brain and spirit for irregular fighting. However, they went forward with the mob and drove in the Turkish outposts and then their supports, until Fakhri, becoming seriously alarmed, came down himself, inspected the front, and at once reinforced the threatened detachment at Bir Abbas to some three thousand strong. The Turks had field guns and howitzers with them, and the added advantage of high ground for observation. They began to worry the Arabs by indirect fire, and nearly dropped a shell on Faisal's tent while all the headmen were conferring within. The Egyptian gunners were asked to return the fire and smother the enemy guns. They had to plead that their weapons were useless, since they could not carry the 9,000 yards. They were derided, and the Arabs ran back again into the defiles. Faisal was deeply discouraged. His men were tired. He had lost many of them. His only effective tactics against the enemy had been to chase in suddenly upon their rear by fast-mounted charges and many camels had been killed, or wounded, or worn out in these expensive measures. He demurred to carrying the whole war upon his own neck, while Abdullah delayed in Mecca, and Ali and Zaid at Rabeg. Finally he withdrew the bulk of his forces, leaving the Harb sub-tribes to keep up pressure on the Turkish supply columns and communications, by a repeated series of such raids as those which he himself found impossible to maintain. Yet he had no fear that the Turks would again come forward against him suddenly. His failure to make any impression on them had not imbued him with the smallest respect for them. His late retirement to Hamra was not forced. It was a gesture of disgust, because he was bored by his obvious impotence and was determined for a little while to have the dignity of rest. I asked Faisal what his plans were now. He said that till Medina fell... They were inevitably tied down there in Hejaz, dancing to Fakhri's tune. In his opinion, the Turks were aiming at the recapture of Mecca. The bulk of their strength was now in a mobile column, which they could move towards Rabig by a choice of routes which kept the Arabs in constant alarm. A passive defense of the Sub hills had shown that the Arabs did not shine as passive resistors. When the enemy moved, they must be countered by an offensive. Maulud, who had sat fidgeting through our long, slow talk, could no longer restrain himself and cried out, Don't write a history of us. The needful thing is to fight and fight and kill them. Give me a battery of Schneider mountain guns and machine guns, and I will finish this off for you. We talk and talk and do nothing. I replied as warmly, and Maulud, a magnificent fighter, who regarded a battle won as a battle wasted if he did not show some wound to prove his part in it, took me up. We wrangled while Faisal sat by and grinned delightedly at us. This talk had been for him a holiday. He was encouraged even by the trifle of my coming, for he was a man of moods, flickering between glory and despair, and just now dead tired. He looked years older than thirty-one, and his dark, appealing eyes sat a little sloping in his face, were bloodshot, and his hollow cheeks deeply lined and puckered with reflection. His nature grudged thinking, for it crippled his speed in action. The labor of it shriveled his features into swift lines of pain. In appearance he was tall, graceful, and vigorous, with the most beautiful gait and a royal dignity of head and shoulders. Of course he knew it, and a great part of his public expression was by sign and gesture. His movements were impetuous. He showed himself hot-tempered and sensitive, even unreasonable, and he ran off soon on tangents. Appetite and physical weakness were mated in him with a spur of courage. His personal charm, his imprudence, the pathetic hint of frailty as the sole reserve of this proud character made him the idol of his followers. One never asked if he were scrupulous, but later he showed that he could return trust for trust, suspicion for suspicion. He was fuller of wit than of humor. His training in Abdul Hamid's entourage had made him pass master in diplomacy. His military service with the Turks had given him a working knowledge of tactics. 
His life in Constantinople and in the Turkish parliament had made him familiar with European questions and manners. He was a careful judge of men. If he had the strength to realize his dreams, he would go very far, for he was wrapped up in his work and lived for nothing else. But the fear was that he would wear himself out by trying to seem to aim always a little higher than the truth, or that he would die of too much action. His men told me how, after a long spell of fighting, in which he had to guard himself and lead the charges and control and encourage them, he had collapsed physically and was carried away from his victory, unconscious, with the foam flecking his lips. Meanwhile, here, as it seemed, was offered to our hand, which had only to be big enough to take it, a prophet who, if veiled, would give cogent form to the idea behind the activity of the Arab revolt. It was all and more than we had hoped for, much more than our halting course deserved. The aim of my trip was fulfilled. My duty was now to take the shortest road to Egypt with the news, and the knowledge gained that evening in the palm wood grew and blossomed in my mind into a thousand branches, laden with fruit and shady leaves, beneath which I sat and half listened and saw visions while the twilight deepened and the night until a line of slaves with lamps came down the winding pass between the palm trunks, and with Faisal and Maloud we walked back through the gardens to the little house, with its courts so full of waiting people, and to the hot inner room in which the familiars were assembled. And there we sat down together to the smoking bowl of rice and meat set upon the food carpet for our supper by the slaves. Next morning I was up early and out among Faisal's troops toward the side of Kief, by myself, trying to feel the pulse of their opinions in a moment. Time was of the essence of my effort, for it was necessary to gain in ten days the impressions which would ordinarily have been the fruit of weeks of observing in my crab fashion, that sideways slipping affair of the senses. Normally I would go along all day, with the sounds immediate, but blind to every detail, only generally aware that there were things red, or things grey, or clear things about me. Today, my eyes had to be switched straight to my brain, that I might note a thing or two the more clearly by contrast with the former mistiness. Such things were nearly always shapes, rocks and trees, or men's bodies in repose or movement, not small things like flowers, nor qualities like color. Yet here was strong need of a lively reporter. In this drab war, the least irregularity was a joy to all, and McMahon's strongest course was to exploit the latent imagination of the general staff. I believed in the Arab movement, and was confident before ever I came, that in it was the idea to tear Turkey into pieces. But others in Egypt lacked faith, and had been taught nothing intelligent of the Arabs in the field. By noting down something of the spirit of these romantics in the hills about the holy cities, I might gain the sympathy of Cairo for the further measures necessary to help them. The men received me cheerfully. Beneath every great rock or bush they sprawled like lazy scorpions, resting from the heat, and refreshing their brown limbs with the early coolness of the shaded stone. Because of my khaki, they took me for a Turk-trained officer who had deserted to them, and were profuse and good-humored but ghastly suggestions of how they should treat me. They were in wild spirits, shouting that the war might last ten years. It was the fattest time the hills had ever known. The Sharif was feeding not only the fighting men, but their families, and paying two pounds a month for a man, four for a camel. Nothing else would have performed the miracle of keeping a tribal army in the field for five months on end. The actual contingents were continually shifting, in obedience to the rule of flesh. A family would own a rifle, and the sons serve in turn for a few days each. Married men alternated between camp and wife, and sometimes a whole clan would become bored and take a rest. Faisal's 8,000 men were one in ten camel corps, and the rest hillmen. They served only under their tribal sheiks and near home, arranging their own food and transport. Blood feuds were nominally healed and really suspended in the Sharifian area. Billy and Juhaina, Atiba and Agil, living and fighting side by side in Faisal's army. All the same, the members of one tribe were shy of those of another, and within the tribe, 
No man would quite trust his neighbor. Each might be, usually was, wholehearted against the Turk, but perhaps not quite to the point of failing to work off a family grudge upon a family enemy in the field. Their acquisitive recklessness made them keen on booty, and wedded them to tear up railways, plunder caravans, and steal camels. But they were too free-minded to endure command, or to fight in team. A man who could fight well by himself made generally a bad soldier, and these champions seemed to me no material for our drilling. But if we strengthened them by light automatic guns of the Lewis type, to be handled by themselves, they might be capable of holding their hills. The Hejaz War was the fight of a rocky, mountainous, barren country, reinforced by a wild horde of mountaineers against an enemy so enriched in equipment by the Germans as almost to have lost virtue for rough-and-tumble war. The hill belt was a paradise for snipers. The valleys, which were the only practicable roads, for miles and miles were not so much valleys as chasms or gorges, sometimes two hundred yard across, but sometimes only twenty, full of twists and turns, one thousand or four thousand feet deep, barren of cover and flanked each side by pitiless granite, basalt, and porphyry. Not in polished slopes, but serrated and split and piled up in thousands of jagged heaps of fragments as hard as metal and nearly as sharp. It seemed to my unaccustomed eyes impossible that without treachery on the part of the mountain tribes, the Turks could dare to break their way through. The sole disquieting feature was the very real success of the Turks in frightening the Arabs by artillery. The sound of a fired cannon sent every man within earshot behind cover. They thought weapons destructive in proportion to their noise. They were not afraid of bullets, nor indeed overmuch of dying. Just the manner of death by shell-fire was unendurable. It seemed to me that their moral confidence was to be restored only by having guns, useful or useless but noisy, on their side. From the magnificent Faisal down to the most naked stripling in the army, the theme was artillery, artillery, artillery. At these close quarters, the bigness of the revolt impressed me. This well-peopled province had suddenly changed its character, from a rout of casual nomad pilferers to an eruption against Turkey. Fighting her, not certainly in our manner, but fiercely enough, in spite of the religion which was to raise the East against us in a holy war. There was among the tribes in the fighting zone a nervous enthusiasm, common, I suppose, to all national risings, but strangely disquieting to one from a land so long delivered that national freedom had become like the water in our mouths, tasteless. Later, I saw Faisal again and promised to do my best for him. My chiefs would arrange a base at Yembo, where the stores and supplies he needed would be put ashore for his exclusive use. We would try to get him officer volunteers from among the prisoners of war captured in Mesopotamia or on the canal. We would form gun crews and machine gun crews from the rank and file in the internment camps, and provide them with such mountain guns and light machine guns as were obtainable in Egypt. Lastly, I would advise that British Army officers, professionals, be sent down to act as advisers and liaison officers with him in the field. This time, our talk was of the pleasantest, and ended in warm thanks from him and an invitation to return as soon as might be. I explained that my duties in Cairo excluded field work, but perhaps my chiefs would let me pay a second visit later on, when his present wants were filled and his movement was going forward prosperously. Meanwhile, I would ask him for facilities to return to the coast, for Egypt. Faisal's care gave me an escort of local sheriffs who guided me to Yembo, through other miles of stark hills, with their hairlines of irrigated valleys threading their barrenness. Yembo, a village Jedda, proved hospitable. Its governor, a Javanese from Mecca, fed me and lodged me for many days till the Suva, Captain Boyle, put into harbor and granted me passage down the coast. Granted me, for I was in a very soiled condition after days of riding light, and I had a native headcloth on my head. And to the Royal Navy, all native things seemed crapulous. 
Boyle, as the senior naval officer in the Red Sea, should have been the exemplar of his type, but he sat on the shadow side of his bridge, reading Bryce's American Constitution too intently to spare me more than fourteen words a day. In Jeddah was the Uralis, with Admiral Weymouth, bound for Port Sudan that he might visit Sir Reginald Wingate at Khartoum. Sir Reginald, as Sirdar of the Egyptian army, had been put in command of the British military side of the Arab adventure, and it was necessary for me to impart my impressions to him. So I begged the Admiral for a passage over sea and a place in his train to Khartoum. This he readily granted after cross-questioning me himself at length. I found that his active mind and broad intelligence had engaged his interest in the Arab revolt from the beginning. He had come down again and again in his flagship to lend a hand when things were critical, and had gone out of his way twenty times to help the shore, which properly was army business. He had given the Arabs guns and machine guns, landing parties and technical help, with unlimited transport and naval cooperation, always making a real pleasure of requests and fulfilling them in overflowing measure. Khartoum felt cool after Arabia, and nerved me to show Sir Reginald Wingate my long reports, in which I urged that the situation seemed full of promise. The main need was skilled assistance, and the campaign should go prosperously if some regular British officers, professionally competent and speaking Arabic, were attached to the Arab leaders as technical advisers to keep us in proper touch. Wingate was glad to hear a hopeful view. The Arab revolt had been his dream for years. So after two or three days in Khartoum, I went down towards Cairo, feeling that the responsible person had accepted all my news. The Nile trip became a holiday. End of chapter 3Chapter 4 of Revolt in the Desert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter 4 Checks Around Yembo. After I had been a few days in Cairo, my chief, General Clayton, told me to return to Arabia and Faisal. This being much against my grain, I urged my complete unfitness for the job, said I hated responsibility. Obviously, the position of a conscientious advisor would be responsible, and that in all my life, objects had been gladder to me than persons, and ideas than objects. So the duty of succeeding with men of disposing them to any purpose, would be doubly hard to me. I was unlike a soldier, hated soldiering, whereas the Sirdar had telegraphed to London for certain regular officers, competent to direct the Arab war. Clayton replied that they might be months arriving, and meanwhile, Faisal must be linked to us and his needs promptly notified to Egypt. So I had to go, leaving to others the Arab bulletin I had founded, the maps I wished to draw, and the file of the war changes of the Turkish army, all fascinating activities in which my training helped me, to take up a role for which I felt no inclination. As our revolt succeeded, onlookers appraised its leadership, but behind the scenes lay all the vices of amateur control, experimental councils, divisions, whimsicality. My journey was to Yembo, now the special base of Faisal's army, as I was starting thence up country to visit Faisal again, news came in of a Turkish repulse. A reconnaissance of their cavalry and camel corps had been pushed too far into the hills, and the Arabs had caught it and scattered it. So I made a happy start with my sponsor for the journey, Sharif Abid al Karim. With him were three or four of his men, all well mounted, and we had a rapid journey, for Abid al Karim was a famous rider who took pride in covering his stages at three times the normal speed. It was not my camel, and the weather was cool and clouded with a taste of rain, so I had no objection. After starting, we cantered for three unbroken hours. That had shaken down our bellies far enough for us to hold more food, and we stopped and ate bread and drank coffee till sunset, 
while Abd al Karim rolled about his carpet in a dog fight with one of the men. When he was exhausted, he sat up, and they told stories and japed till they were breathed enough to get up and dance. Everything was very free, very good tempered, and not at all dignified. When we restarted, an hour's mad race in the dusk brought us to the foot of a low range. We crossed it, going up a narrow, winding, sandy valley. Because this had run in flood a few days earlier, the going was firm for our panting camels. But the ascent was steep, and we had to take it at walking pace. This pleased me, but so angered Abd al Karim that when, in a short hour, we reached the watershed, he thrust his mount forward again and led us at breakneck speed downhill in the yielding night. A fair road, fortunately, with sand and pebbles underfoot. For half an hour, when the land flattened out, and we came to the outlying plantations of Nakhl Mubarak, chief date gardens of the southern Juhena. As we got near, we saw through the palm trees flame, and the flame-lit smoke of many fires, while the hollow ground re-echoed with the roaring of thousands of excited camels, and volleying of shots or shoutings in the darkness of lost men, who sought through the crowd to rejoin their friends. As we had heard in Yenbo that the Nekel were deserted, this tumult meant something strange, perhaps hostile. We crept quietly past an end of the grove and along a narrow street between man-high mud walls to a silent group of houses. Abd al Karim forced the courtyard door of the first on our left, led the camels within, and hobbled them down by the walls that they might remain unseen. Then he slipped a cartridge into the breech of his rifle and stole off on tiptoe down the street towards the noise to find out what was happening. We waited for him, the sweat of the ride slowly drying in our clothes as we sat there in the chill night, watching. He came back after half an hour to say that Faisal with his camel corps had just arrived, and we were to go down and join him. So we led the camels out and mounted, and rode in file down another lane on a bank between houses, with a sunk garden of palms on our right. Its end was filled with a solid crowd of Arabs and camels, mixed together in the wildest confusion and all crying aloud. We pressed through them and down a ramp suddenly into the bed of the Wadi Embo, a broad open space. How broad could only be guessed from the irregular lines of watchfires glimmering over it to a great distance. Also, it was very damp, with slime, the relic of a shallow flood two days before, yet covering its stones. Our camels found it slippery underfoot, and began to move timidly. We had no opportunity to notice this, or indeed anything just now, except the mass of Faisal's army, filling the valley from side to side. There were hundreds of fires of thornwood, and round them were Arabs making coffee, or eating, or sleeping muffled like dead men in their cloaks, packed together closely in the confusion of camels. So many camels in company made a mess indescribable, couched as they were or tied down all over the camping ground, with more ever coming in, and the old ones leaping up on three legs to join them, roaring with hunger and agitation. Patrols were going out, caravans being unloaded, and dozens of Egyptian mules bucking angrily over the middle of the scene. We plowed our way through this din, and in an island of calm at the very center of the valley bed found Sharif Faisal, we halted our camels by his side. On his carpet, spread barely over the stones, he was sitting between Sharif Sharaf, the Kaim Makam both of the Emirat and of Taif, his cousin, and Maloud, the rugged, slashing old Mesopotamian patriot, now acting as his ADC. In front of him knelt a secretary, taking down an order, and beyond him, another reading reports aloud by the light of a silvered lamp which a slave was holding. The night was windless, the air heavy, and the unshielded flame poised there stiff and straight. Faisal, quiet as ever, welcomed me with a smile until he could finish his dictation. After it, he apologized for my disorderly reception and waved the slaves back to give us privacy. As they retired with the onlookers, a wild camel leaped into the open space in front of us, plunging and trumpeting. Maloud dashed at its head to drag it away, but it dragged him instead. And, its load of grass ropes for camel fodder coming untied, 
there poured down over the taciturn sheriff, the lamp, and myself, an avalanche of hay. God be praised, said Faisal gravely, that it was neither batter nor bags of gold. Then he explained to me what unexpected things had happened in the last twenty-four hours on the battlefront. The Turks had slipped round the head of the Arab barrier forces in Wadi Safra by a side road in the hills, and had cut their retreat. The Harb, in a panic, had melted into the ravines on each side and escaped through them in parties of twos and threes. The Turkish mounted men poured down the empty valley and over the different pass to Bir Said, where Emir Zaid, Faisal's young half-brother, was camped with a Harb contingent. The Turks took Zaid by surprise and routed him. His force melted into a loose mob of fugitives riding wildly through the night towards Yembo. Thereby the road to Yembo was laid open to the Turks, and Faisal had rushed down here only an hour before our arrival, with five thousand men to protect his base until something properly defensive could be arranged. The situation was serious, but Faisal's presence here might attract the enemy and caused them to lose more days trying to catch his field army while we strengthened Yembo. Meanwhile, he was doing all he could, quite cheerfully. So I sat down and listened to the news, or to the petitions, complaints, and difficulties being brought in and settled by him summarily. This lasted till half-past four in the morning. It grew very cold as the damp of the valley rose through the carpet and soaked our clothes. The camp gradually stilled as the tired men and animals went one by one to sleep. A white mist collected softly over them, and in it the fires became slow pillars of smoke. Faisal at last finished the urgent work. We ate a half-dozen dates, a frigid comfort, and curled up on the wet carpet. As I lay there in a shiver, I saw the Biasha guards creep up and spread their cloaks gently over Faisal when they were sure that he was sleeping. An hour later, we got up stiffly in the false dawn, too cold to go on pretending and lying down, and the slaves lit a fire of palm ribs to warm us, while Sharaf and myself searched for food and fuel enough for the moment. Messengers were still coming in from all sides with evil rumors of an immediate attack, and the camp was not far off panic. So Faisal decided to move to another position, partly because we should be washed out of this one if it rained anywhere in the hills, and partly to occupy his men's minds. When his drums began to beat, the camels were loaded hurriedly. After the second signal, everyone leaped into the saddle and drew off to left or right, leaving a broad lane up which Faisal rode on his mare, with Sharaf a pace behind him, and then Ali. The standard-bearer, a splendid wild man from Nejed, with his hawk's face framed in long plates of jet-black hair falling downward from his temples. Ali was dressed garishly and rode a tall camel. Behind him were all the mob of sharifs and sheikhs and slaves, and myself, pell-mell. There were eight hundred in the bodyguard that morning. The next two days I spent in Faisal's company, and so got a deeper experience of his method of command, at an interesting season when the morale of his men was suffering heavily from the scare reports brought in and from the defection of the northern harb. Faisal, fighting to make up their lost spirits, did it most surely by lending of his own to every one within reach. He was accessible to all who stood outside his tent and waited for notice, and he never cut short petitions, even when men came in chorus with their grief in a song of many verses and sang them around us in the dark. He listened always, and if he did not settle the case himself, called Sharaf or Fayez to arrange it for him. This extreme patience was a further lesson to me of what native headship in Arabia meant. His self-control seemed equally great. When Mirzuk el Tikhami, his guest master, came in from Zaid to explain the shameful story of their rout, Faisal just laughed at him in public, and sent him aside to wait while he saw the shakes of the Harb and the Agil, whose carelessness had been mainly responsible for the disaster. These he rallied gently, chafing them for having done this or that, for having inflicted such losses, or lost so much. Then he called back Mirzuk and lowered the tent flap, a sign that there was private business to be done. 
I thought of the meaning of Faisal's name, the sword flashing downward in the stroke, and feared a scene. But he made room for Mirzak on his carpet, and said, Come, tell us more of your knights and marvels of the battle. Amuse us. Faisal, in speaking, had a rich musical voice, and used it carefully upon his men. To them he talked in tribal dialect, but with a curious hesitant manner, as though faltering painfully among phrases, looking inward for the just word. His thought, perhaps, moved only by a little in front of his speech, for the phrases at last chosen were usually the simplest, which gave an effect emotional and sincere. It seemed possible, so thin was the screen of words, to see the pure and very brave spirit shining out. The routine of our life in camp was simple. Just before daybreak, the army imam used to utter an astounding call to prayer. His voice was harsh and very powerful, and we were effectually roused, whether we prayed or cursed. As soon as he ended, Faisal's imam cried gently and musically from just outside the tent. In a minute, one of Faisal's five slaves came round with sweetened coffee. Sugar for the first cup in the chill of dawn was considered fit. An hour or so later, the flap of Faisal's sleeping tent would be thrown back, his invitation to callers from the household. There would be four or five present, and after the morning's news, a tray of breakfast would be carried in. The staple of this was dates, but sometimes Hedris, the body slave, would give us odd biscuits and cereals of his own trying. After breakfast, we would play with bitter coffee and sweet tea in alternation, while Faisal's correspondence was dealt with by dictation to his secretaries. One of these was Faiz, the adventurous. Another was the imam, a sad-faced person made conspicuous in the army by the baggy umbrella hanging from his saddle bow. Occasionally, a man was given private audience at this hour, but seldom, as the sleeping tent was strictly for the Sharif's own use. It was an ordinary bell tent, furnished with cigarettes, a camp bed, a fairly good curd rug, a poor Shirazi, and the delightful old Baluch prayer carpet on which he prayed. At about eight o'clock in the morning, Faisal would buckle on his ceremonial dagger and walk across to the reception tent. He would sit down at the end of the tent facing the open side, and we with our backs against the wall, in a semicircle out from him. The slaves brought up the rear and clustered round the open wall of the tent to control the besetting supplicants who lay on the sand in the tent mouth or beyond, waiting their turn. If possible, business was got through by noon, when the emir liked to rise. We of the household and any guests then reassembled in the living tent, and Hedris and Salem carried in the luncheon tray, on which were as many dishes as circumstances permitted. Faisal was an inordinate smoker, but a very light eater, and he used to make believe with his fingers or a spoon among the beans, lentils, spinach, rice, and sweet cakes, till he judged that we had had enough, when at a wave of his hand the tray would disappear, as other slaves walked forward to pour water for our fingers at the tent door. Fat men, like Muhammad ibn Shafia, made a comic grievance of the emir's quick and delicate meals, and would have food of their own prepared for them when they came away. After lunch, we would talk a little, while sucking up two cups of coffee and savoring two glasses full of syrup-like green tea. Then till two in the afternoon, the curtain of the living tent was down, signifying that Faisal was sleeping, or reading, or doing private business. Afterwards, he would sit again in the reception tent till he had finished with all who wanted him. I never saw an Arab leave him dissatisfied or hurt, a tribute to his tact and to his memory, for he seemed never to halt for loss of a fact, nor to stumble over a relationship. If there were time after second audience, he would walk with his friends. Between six and seven there was brought in the evening meal, to which all present in headquarters were called by the slaves. It resembled the lunch. This meal ended our day, save for the stealthy offering by a barefooted slave of a tray of tea glasses at protracted intervals. Faisal did not sleep till very late, and never betrayed a wish to hasten our going. 
in the evening he relaxed as far as possible and avoided avoidable work very rarely he would play chess with the unthinking directness of a fencer and brilliantly sometimes perhaps for my benefit he told stories of what he had seen in syria and scraps of turkish secret history or family affairs i learned much of the men and parties in the hejaz from his lips suddenly faisal asked me if i would wear arab clothes like his own while in the camp i should find it better for my own part since it was a comfortable dress in which to live arab fashion as we must do besides the tribesmen would then understand how to take me the only wearers of khaki in their experience had been turkish officers before whom they took up an instinctive defense if i wore meccan clothes they would behave to me as though i were really one of the leaders and i might slip in and out of faisal's tent without making a sensation which he had to explain away each time to strangers i agreed at once very gladly hedris was pleased too and exercised his fancy in fitting me out in splendid white silk and gold embroidered wedding garments which had been sent to faisal lately was it a hint by his great aunt in mecca i took a stroll in the new looseness of them round the palm gardens to accustom myself to their feel faisal's stand in nakal mubarak could in the nature of things only be a pause and i felt that i had better get back to yembo to think seriously about our amphibious defense of this port the navy having promised its every help we settled that i should consult zaid and act with him as seemed best faisal gave me a magnificent bay camel for the trip back we marched to the Yagida hills by a new road wadi masari because of a scare of turkish patrols on the more direct line better ibn shafia was with me and we did the distance gently in a single stage of six hours getting to yembo before dawn being tired after three strenuous days of little sleep among constant alarms and excitements i went straight to garland's empty house he was living on board ship in the harbor and fell asleep on a bench but afterwards i was called out again by the news that sharif zaid was coming and went down to the walls to see the beaten force ride in there were about eight hundred of them quiet but in no other way mortified by their shame Zaid himself seemed finely indifferent as he entered the town he turned and cried to abd al qadir the governor riding behind him why your town is ruinous i must telegraph to my father for forty masons to repair the public buildings and this he actually did i had telegraphed to captain boyle the british senior naval officer in the red sea that yembo was gravely threatened and boyle at once replied that his fleet would be there in time this readiness was an opportune consolation worse news came along next day the turks by throwing a strong force forward from bir said against nakal mubarak had closed with faisal's levies while they were yet unsteady after a short fight faisal had broken off yielded his ground and was retreating here our war seemed entering its last act i took my camera and from the parapet of the medina gate got a fine photograph of the brothers coming in faisal had nearly two thousand men with him but none of the juhaina tribesmen it looked like treachery and a real defection of the tribes things which both of us had ruled out of court as impossible i called at once at his house and he told me the history the turks had come on with three battalions and a number of mule-mounted infantry and camelry they got across wadi yembo to the groves in their first onset and thus threatened the arab communications with yembo they were also able to shell nakal mubarak freely with their seven guns faisal was not a whit dismayed but threw out the johanna on his left to work down the great valley his center and right he kept in nakal mubarak and he sent the egyptian artillery to deny the yembo road to the turks then he opened fire with his own two fifteen pounders Rasim, a Syrian officer, formerly a battery commander in the Turkish army, was fighting these two guns, and he made a great demonstration with them. They had been sent down as a gift from Egypt anyhow, old rubbish thought serviceable for the wild Arabs, so Rasim had no sights nor rangefinder, 
no range tables, no high explosive. His distance might have been 6,000 yards, but the fuses of his shrapnel were Boer War antiquities, full of green mold, and if they burst it was sometimes short in the air and sometimes grazing. However, he had no means of getting his ammunition away if things went wrong, so he blazed off at speed, shouting with laughter at this fashion of making war. And the tribesmen, seeing the commander so merry, took heart of grace themselves. By God, said one, those are the real guns, the importance of their noise. Rasim swore that the Turks were dying in heaps, and the Arabs charged forward warmly at his word. Things were going well and Faisal had the hope of a decisive success when suddenly his left wing in the valley wavered, halted. Finally it turned its back on the enemy and retired tumultuously to the camping ground. Faisal, in the center, galloped to Rasim and cried that the Juhaina had broken and he was to save the guns. Rasim yoked up the teams and trotted away. After him streamed the levies. Faisal and his household composed the rear, and in deliberate procession they moved down towards Yembo leaving the Johanna under their leader, Sharif Abed al-Karim, my old guide, with the Turks on the battlefield. As I was still hearing of this sad end, and cursing with him the traitor Bedawi brothers, there was a stir about the door, and Abed al-Karim broke through the slaves, swung up to the dais, kissed Faisal's head rope in salutation, and sat down beside us. Faisal, with a gasping stare at him, said, How? and Abd al-Karim explained their dismay at the sudden flight of Faisal, and how he with his brother and their gallant men had fought the Turks for the whole night, alone, without artillery, till the palm groves became untenable and they too had been driven back. His brother with half the manhood of the tribe was just entering the gate. The others had vanished up Wadi Yembo for water. And why did you retire to the campground behind us during the battle? asked Faisal. Only to make ourselves a cup of coffee, said Abd al-Karim. We had fought from sunrise, and it was dusk. We were very tired and thirsty. Faisal and I lay back and laughed. Then we went to see what could be done to save the town. Yenbo, on the top of its flat reef of coral, rose perhaps twenty feet above the sea, and was compassed by water on two sides. The other two sides looked over flat stretches of sand, soft in places, destitute of cover for miles, and with no fresh water upon them anywhere. In daylight, if defended by artillery and machine gun fire, the place should be impregnable. The artillery was arriving every minute, for Boyle, as usual better than his word, had concentrated five ships on us in less than twenty-four hours. He put the monitor, M31, whose shallow draft fitted her for the job, in the end of the southeastern creek of the harbour, whence she could rake the probable direction of a Turkish advance with her six-inch guns. Crocker, her captain, was very anxious to let off those itching guns. The larger ships were moored to fire over the town at longer range, or to take the other flank from the northern harbour. The searchlights of Dufferin and M31 crossed on the plain beyond the town. The Arabs, delighted to count up the quantity of vessels in the harbour, were prepared to contribute their part to the night's entertainment. They gave us good hope there would be no further panic. But to reassure them fully, they needed some sort of rampart to defend, medieval fashion. So we took the crumbling, salt-riddled wall of the place, doubled it with a second, packed earth between the two, and raised them till our 16th century bastions were rifle-proof at least, and probably proof against the Turkish mountain guns. Outside the bastions we put barbed wire, festooned between cisterns on the rain catchments beyond the walls. We dug in machine gun nests in the best angles and manned them with Faisal's regular gunners. The Egyptians, like everyone else given a place in the scheme, were gratifyingly happy. Garland, an ordnance officer lent us by the Sirdar, was engineer-in-chief and chief advisor. After sundown, the town quivered with suppressed excitement. So long as the day lasted, there had been shouts and joy shots and wild bursts of frenzy among the workmen. But when dark came, they went back to feed and a hush fell. Nearly everyone sat up that night. There was one alarm about eleven o'clock. Our outpost had met the enemy only three miles outside the town. Garland, with a crier, 
went through the few streets and called the garrison. They tumbled straight out and went to their places in dead silence, without a shot or a loose shout. The seamen on the minaret sent warning to the ships, whose combined searchlights began slowly to traverse the plain in complex intersections, drawing pencils of wheeling light across the flats which the attacking force must cross. However, no sign was made, and no cause given us to open fire. Afterwards, we heard the Turks' hearts had failed them at the silence and the blaze of lighted ships from end to end of the harbour, with the eerie beams of the searchlights revealing the bleakness of the glasses they would have to cross. So they turned back, and that night, I believe, they lost their war. Personally, I was on the Suva, to be undisturbed and sleeping splendidly at last. So I was grateful to the prudence of the enemy, as though we might perhaps have won a glorious victory, I was ready to give much more for just that eight hours on broken rest. End of chapter four. Chapter five of Revolt in the Desert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter 5. Faisal Strikes North. Colonel Wilson came up to Yembo to persuade us of the necessity of an immediate operation against Wej, the next port after Yembo going northward, and the point from which the Turks were threatening Faisal's rear. If we swung round at it suddenly, the initiative would pass to us. Faisal was a fine, hot workman, wholeheartedly doing a thing when he had agreed to it. He pledged his word that he would go at once. So he and I sat down together on New Year's Day, for consideration of what this move meant to us and to the Turks. Faisal suggested taking nearly all the Johanna to Wej with him, and adding to them enough of the Harb and Billy, Atiba and Agail, to give the mass a many-tribe character. We wanted this march, which would be in its way a closing act of the war in northern Hejaz, to send a rumor through the length and breadth of western Arabia. Faisal was nervous over abandoning Yambo, hitherto his indispensable base in the second seaport of Hejaz, and when casting about for further expedients to distract the Turks from its occupation, we suddenly remembered Sidi Abdullah. He had some five thousand irregulars and a few guns, and machine guns. Faisal suggested that he move to Wadi Ais, a historic valley of springs which lay just 100 kilometers north of Medina, a direct threat on Fakhri's railway communications with Damascus. The proposal was obviously an inspiration, and we sent off Raja al Kalouwi at once to put it to Abdullah. So sure were we of his adopting it that we urged Faisal to move away from Wadi Yambo northward on the first stage to Wej, without waiting a reply. He agreed, and on January 3, 1917, we took the wide upper road through Wadi Masari for Owais, a group of wells about 15 miles to the north of Yembo. The hills were beautiful today. The rains of December had been abundant, and the warm sun after them had deceived the earth into believing it was spring so a thin grass had come up in all the hollows and flat places. The blades, single, straight, and very slender, shot up between the stones. If a man bent over from his saddle and looked downward, he would see no new color in the ground, but by looking forward and getting a distant slope at a flat angle with his eye, he could feel a lively mist of pale green here and there over the surface of slate blue and brown red rock. In places, the growth was strong, and our painstaking camels had become prosperous grazing on it. The starting signal went, but only for us in the Agil. The other units of the army, standing each man by his couched camel, lined up beside our road, and as Faisal came near, saluted him in silence. He called back cheerfully, Peace upon you, and each head shake returned the phrase. When we had passed, they mounted, taking the time from their chiefs, 
and so the forces behind us swelled till there was a line of men and camels winding along the narrow pass towards the watershed for as far back as the eye reached Faisal's greetings had been the only sounds before we reached the crest of the rise where the valley opened out and became a gentle forward slope of soft shingle and flint bedded in sand but there ibn dakil the keen sheikh of rus who had raised this contingent of agil two years before to aid turkey and had brought it over with him intact to the sharif when the revolt came dropped back a pace or two marshalled our following into a broad column of ordered ranks and made the drums strike up everyone burst out singing a full-throated song in honor of amir faisal and his family the march became rather splendid and barbaric first rode faisal in white then Sharaf at his right in red headcloth and henna dyed tunic and cloak, myself on his left in white and scarlet, behind us three banners of faded crimson silk with gilt spikes, behind them the drummers playing a march, and behind them again the wild mass of twelve hundred bouncing camels of the bodyguard, packed as closely as they could move the men in every variety of colored clothes and the camels nearly as brilliant in their trappings we filled the valley to its banks with our flashing stream the risk of the fall of yembo while we hunted wej was great and it would be wise to empty it of stores boyle gave me an opportunity by signaling that harding would be made available for transport she was an indian troop ship and her lowest troop deck had great square ports along the water level Captain Linbury opened these for us, and we stuffed straight in 8,000 rifles, 3 million rounds of ammunition, thousands of shells, quantities of rice and flour, a shed full of uniforms, two tons of high explosive, and all our petrol, pell-mell. It was like posting letters in a box. In no time, she had taken a 1,000 tons of stuff. Boyle came in, eager for news, he promised the Harding as depot ship throughout, to land food and water whenever needed, and this solved the main difficulty. The Navy were already collecting. Half the Red Sea fleet would be present. The Admiral was expected, and landing parties were being drilled on every ship. Everyone was dying white duck, khaki-colored, or sharpening bayonets, or practicing with rifles. I hoped silently, in their despite, that there would be no fighting. Faisal had nearly 10,000 men, enough to fill the whole Billy country with armed parties and carry off everything not too heavy or too hot. It was sure that we would take Wej. The fear was lest numbers of Faisal's hosts die of hunger or thirst on the way. However, the country to Umlej, halfway, was friendly. Nothing tragic could happen so far as that. Therefore, Faisal started on the very day that Abdullah replied welcoming the Ayas plan. The same day came news of my relief. Newcomb, the regular colonel being sent to Hejaz as chief of our military mission, had arrived in Egypt, and his two staff officers, Cox and Vickery, were actually on their way down the Red Sea to join this expedition. Boyle took me to Umlej in the Suva, and we went ashore to get the news. The sheikh told us that Faisal would arrive today at Bir al-Wahedi, the water supply, four miles inland. We sent up a message for him and then walked over to the fort which Boyle had shelled some months before from the fox. It was just a rubble barrack, and Boyle looked at the ruins and said, I'm rather ashamed of myself for smashing such a potty place. He was a very professional officer, alert, businesslike, and official sometimes a little intolerant of easygoing things and people. Red-haired men are seldom patient. Ginger Boyle, as they called him, was warm. While we were looking over the ruins, four grey-ragged elders of the village came up and asked leave to speak. They said that some months before, a sudden two-funneled ship had come up and destroyed their fort. They were now required to rebuild it for the police of the Arab government. Might they ask the generous captain of this peaceable one-funneled ship for a little timber, or for other material help toward the restoration? 
Boyle was restless at their long speech and snapped at me. What is it? What do they want? I said, nothing. They were describing the terrible effect of the fox's bombardment. Boyle looked round him for a moment and smiled grimly. It's a fair mess. Next day, Vickery arrived. He was a gunner, and in his ten years' service in the Sudan had learned Arabic, both literary and colloquial, so well that he would quit us of all need of an interpreter. We arranged to go up with Boyle to Faisal's camp, to make the timetable for the attack, and after lunch, Englishmen and Arabs got to work and discussed the remaining march to Wedge. We decided to break the army into sections, and that these should proceed independently to our concentration place of Abu Zarabet in Hamd, after which there was no water before Wej. But Boyle agreed that the Harding should take station for a single night in Sherm Haban, supposed to be a possible harbour, and land twenty tons of water for us on the beach, so that was settled. For the attack on Wej, we offered Boyle an Arab landing party of several hundred Harb and Juhaina peasantry. He decided to put them on another deck of the many-stomached Harding. They, with the naval party, would land north of the town, where the Turks had no post to block a landing, and whence Wedge and its harbour were best turned. Boyle would have at least six ships, with fifty guns to occupy the Turks' mines, and a seaplane ship to direct the guns. We would be at Abu Zarabet on the 20th of the month, at Haban for the Harding's water on the 22nd, and the landing party should go ashore at dawn on the 23rd, by which time our mounted men would have closed all roads of escape from the town. The news from Rabig was good, and the Turks had made no attempt to profit by the nakedness of Yembo. These were our hazards, and when Boyle's wireless set them at rest, we were mightily encouraged. Abdullah was almost in ice. We were halfway to Wej. The initiative had passed to the Arabs. I was so joyous that for a moment I forgot my self-control and said exultingly that in a year we would be tapping on the gates of Damascus. A chill came over the feeling in the tent and my hopefulness died. But it was not an impossible dream, for five months later I was in Damascus, and a year after that I was its de facto governor. The army at Bir el Waheda amounted to 5,100 camel riders and 5,300 men on foot, with four Krupp mountain guns and ten machine guns. And for transport, we had 380 baggage camels. Our start was set for January the 18th, just after noon, and punctually by lunchtime, Faisal's work was finished. After lunch, the tent was struck. We went to our camels, where they were couched in a circle, saddled and loaded, each held short by the slave, standing on its double foreleg. The kettle drummer, waiting beside Ibn Dakhil, who commanded the bodyguard, rolled his drum seven or eight times, and everything became still. We watched Faisal. He got up from his rug, on which he had been saying a last word to Abd al-Karim, caught the saddle pommels in his hands, put his knee on the side and said aloud, Make God your agent. The slave released the camel, which sprang up. When it was on its feet, Faisal passed his other leg across its back, swept his skirts and his cloak under him by a wave of the arm, and settled himself in the saddle. As his camel moved, we jumped for hours, and the whole mob rose together, some of the beasts roaring, but the most quiet, as trained she-camels should be. They took their first abrupt steps, and we riders had quickly to hook our legs round the front cantles and pick up the head stalls to check the pace. We then looked where Faisal was and tapped our mounts' heads gently round and pressed them on the shoulders with our bare feet till they were in line beside him. Ibn Dakil came up, and after a glance at the country in the direction of march, passed a short order for the Agil to arrange themselves in wings out to right and left of us. There came a warning patter from the drums, and the poet of the right wing burst into strident song, a single invented couplet, a Faisal and the pleasures he would afford us at Wej. The right wing listened to the verse intently, took it up and sang it together once, 
twice and three times, with pride and self-satisfaction and derision. However, before they could brandish it a fourth time, the poet of the left wing broke out in extempore reply, in the same meter, in answering rhyme, and capping the sentiment. The left wing cheered it in a roar of triumph. The drums tapped again. The standard bearers threw out their great crimson banners, and the whole guard, right, left, and center, broke together into the rousing regimental chorus. I've lost Britain and I've lost Gaul. I've lost Rome and, worst of all, I've lost Lalligay. Only it was Nejed they had lost, and the women of the Ma'abda, and their future lay from Jidda towards Suez. Yet it was a good song, with a rhythmical beat which the camels loved. So they put down their heads, stretched their necks out far, and with lengthened pace shuffled forward musingly while it lasted. Our road today was easy for them, since it was over firm sand slopes, long, slowly rising waves of dunes, bareback but for scrub in the folds, or barren palm trees solitary in the moist depressions. Afterwards, in a broad flat, two horsemen came cantering across from the left to greet Faisal. I knew the first one, dirty old blear-eyed Muhammad Ali al-Bidawi, emir of the Juhayna. But the second looked strange. When he came nearer, I saw he was in khaki uniform, with a cloak to cover it and a silk headcloth and head rope much awry. He looked up, and there was Newcomb's red and peeling face, with straining eyes and vehement mouth, a strong, humorous grin between the jaws. He had arrived at Umlej this morning, and hearing we were only just off, had seized Sheikh Yusuf's fastest horse and galloped after us. I offered him my spare camel and an introduction to Faisal, whom he greeted like an old school friend, and at once they plunged into the midst of things, suggesting, debating, planning at lightning speed. Newcomb's initial velocity was enormous, and the freshness of the day, and the life and happiness of the army, gave inspiration to the march, and brought the future bubbling out of us without pain. The route was not easy to decide with the poor help of the Musa Juhena, our informants. They seemed to have no unit of time smaller than the half-day, or of distance between the span and the stage, and the stage might be from six to sixteen hours, according to the man's will and camel. Intercommunication between our units was hindered, because often there was no one who could read or write in either. Delay, confusion, hunger, and thirst marred this expedition. These might have been avoided had time let us examine the route beforehand. The animals were without food for nearly three days, and the men marched the last fifty miles on half a gallon of water, with nothing to eat. It did not in any way dim their spirit, and they trotted into Wej gaily enough, hoarsely singing and executing mock charges. But Faisal said that another hot and barren midday would have broken both their speed and their energy. When business ended, Newcomb and I went off to sleep in the tent Faisal had lent us as a special luxury. Baggage conditions were so hard and important for us that we rich took pride in faring like the men who could not transport unnecessary things. And never before had I had a tent of my own. We pitched it at the very edge of a bluff of the foothills, a bluff no wider than the tent and rounded, so that the slope went straight down from the pegs of the door flap. There we found sitting and waiting for us Abd al Karim, the young Bedawi Sharif, wrapped up to the eyes in his headcloth and cloak, since the evening was chill and threatened rain. He had come to ask me for a mule with saddle and bridle. The smart appearance of our M.I. company in breeches and puttees and their fine new animals had roused his desire. I played with his eagerness and put him off advancing a condition that he should ask me after our successful arrival at Wej, and with this he was content. We hungered for sleep, and at last he rose to go, but chancing to look across the valley, saw the hollows beneath and about us, winking with the faint campfires of the scattered contingents. He called me out to look, 
and swept his arm round, saying, half sadly, We are no longer Arabs, but a people. During the morning it rained persistently, and we were glad to see more water coming to us, and so comfortable in the tents at Semna that we delayed our start till the sun shone again in the early afternoon. Then we rode westward down the valley in the fresh light. First behind us came the Agil. After them, Abd al-Karim led his Gufa men, about seven hundred of them mounted, with more than that number following afoot. They were dressed in white, with large head shawls of red and black striped cotton, and they waved green palm branches instead of banners. Next to them rode Sharif Muhammad Ali Abu Sharain, an old patriarch with a long curling grey beard and an upright carriage of himself. His three hundred riders were Ashraf of the Ayaishi, Juhaina stock, known Sharifs but only acknowledged in the mass since they had not inscribed pedigrees. They wore rusty red tunics, henna dyed, under black cloaks, and carried swords. Each had a slave crouch behind him on the crupper to help him with rifle and dagger in the fight, and to watch his camel and cook for him on the road. The slaves, as befitted slaves of poor masters, were very little dressed. Their strong black legs gripped the camel's woolly sides as in a vice, to lessen the shocks inevitable on their bony perches, while they had knotted up their rags of shirts into the plaited tong about their loins, to save them from the fouling of the camels and their staling on the march. Semna water was medicinal, and our animals' dung flowed like green soup down their hawks that day. Behind the Ashraf came the crimson banner of our last tribal detachment, the Rifa'a under Audi ibn Zuwaid the old wheedling sea pirate, who had robbed the Stutzingen mission and thrown their wireless and their Indian servants into the sea at Yembo. The sharks presumably refused the wireless, but we had spent fruitless hours dragging for it in the harbour. Audi still wore a long, rich, fur-lined German officer's greatcoat, a garment little suited to the climate, but as he insisted, magnificent booty. He had about a thousand men, three-quarters of them on foot. And next him marched Racim, the gunner commandant, with his four old crook guns on the pack mules, just as we had lifted them from the Egyptian army. Racim was a sardonic Damascene, who rose laughing to every crisis and slunk about sore-headed with grievances when things went well. On this day there were dreadful murmurings, for alongside him rode Abdullah al Dalemi in charge of machine guns, a quick, clever, superficial but attractive officer, much of the professional type, whose great joy was to develop some rankling sorrow in Racim, till it discharged full blast on Faisal or myself. Today I helped him by smiling to Racim that we were moving at intervals of a quarter day, in echelon of sub-tribes. Racim looked over the new-washed underwood, where raindrops glistened in the light of the sun setting redly across the waves below a ceiling of clouds, and looked too at the wild mob of Bedouins, racing here and there on foot after birds, and rabbits, and giant lizards, and gerboas, and one another, and assented sourly, saying that he too would shortly become a sub-tribe and echelon himself half a day to one side or other, and be quit of flies. At first starting, a man in the crowd had shot a hare from the saddle, but because of the risk of wild shooting, Faisal had then forbidden it, and those later put up by our camel's feet were chased with sticks. We laughed at the sudden commotion in the marching companies, cries and camels swerving violently, their riders leaping off and laying out wildly with their canes to kill, or be pickers up of a kill. Faisal was happy to see the army win so much meat, but disgusted at the shameless Juhaina appetite for lizards and gerboas. We rode over the flat sand among the thorn trees, which here were plentiful and large, till we came out on the sea beach and turned northward along a broad, well-beaten track, the Egyptian pilgrim road. It ran within fifty yards of the sea, and we could go up at thirty or forty singing files abreast. An old lava bed, half buried in sand, jutted out from the hills four or five miles inland, 
and made a promontory. The road cut across this, but at the near side were some mud flats, on which shallow reaches of water burned in the last light of the west. This was our expected stage, and Faisal signaled the halt. We got off our camels and stretched ourselves, sat down or walked before supper to the sea and bathed by hundreds, a splashing, screaming mob of fish-like naked men of all earth's colors. Supper was to look forward to, as a Juhani that afternoon had shot a gazelle for Faisal. Gazelle meat was found better than any other in the desert, because this beast, however barren the land and dry the water holes, seemed to own always a fat, juicy body. Next day, we rode easily. The journey was pleasant, for it was cool. There were a lot of us, and we two Englishmen had a tent in which we could shut ourselves up and be alone. A weariness of the desert was the living always in company, each of the party hearing all that was said and seeing all that was done by the others, day and night. To have privacy, as Newcomb and I had, was ten thousand times more restful than the open life, but the work suffered by the creation of such a bar between leaders and men. Among the Arabs there were no distinctions, traditional or natural, except the unconscious power given a famous sheikh by virtue of his accomplishment, and they taught me that no man could be their leader except he ate the ranks food, wore their clothes, lived level with them, and yet appeared better in himself. In the morning, we pressed toward Abu Zarebat over a sweeping fall of bare black gravel. Once, we halted and began to feel that a great depression lay in front of us. But not till two in the afternoon, after we had crossed a basalt outcrop, did we look out over a trough fifteen miles across, which was Wadi Hamt, escaped from the hills. To our eyes, sated with small things, it was a fair sight, this end of a dry river longer than the Tigris, the greatest valley in Arabia, first understood by Doughty and as yet unexplored. Full of expectation, we rode down the gravel slopes on which tufts of grass became more frequent, till at three o'clock we entered the Wadi itself, a bed about a mile wide, filled with clumps of asla bushes, round which clung sandy hillocks each a few feet high. Their sand was not pure, but seamed with lines of dry and brittle clay, last indications of old flood levels. These divided them sharply into layers, rotten with salty mud and flaking away, so that our camels sank in, fetlock deep, with a crunching noise like breaking pastry. The dust rose up in thick clouds, thickened yet more by the sunlight held in them, for the dead air of the hollow was a dazzle. The ranks behind could not see where they were going, which was difficult for them, as the hillocks came closer together and the riverbed split into a maze of shallow channels. The work of partial floods year after year. Before we gained the middle of the valley, everything was overgrown by brushwood, which sprouted sideways from the mounds and laced one to another with tangled twigs, as dry, dusty, and brittle as old bone. We tucked in the streamers of our gaudy saddlebags to prevent their being jerked off by the bushes, drew cloaks tight over our clothes, bent our heads down to guard our eyes, and crashed through like a storm amongst reeds. The dust was blinding and choking, and the snapping of the branches, grumbles of the camels, Shouts and laughter of the men made a rare adventure. Before we quite reached the far bank, the ground suddenly cleared at a clay bottom in which stood a deep brown water pool, 80 yards long and about 15 yards wide. This was the flood water of Abu Zarabat, our goal. We went a few yards further, through the last scrub, and reached the open north bank where Faisal had appointed the camp. So we stopped our camels, and the slaves unloaded them and set up the tents. While we walked back to see the mules, thirsty after their long day's march, rush with the foot soldiers into the pond, kicking and splashing with pleasure in the sweet water. The abundance of fuel was an added happiness, and in whatever place they chose to camp, each group of friends had a roaring fire. Very welcome, as a wet evening mist rose eight feet out of the ground and our woolen cloaks stiffened and grew cold with its silver beads and their coarse wool. 
It was a black night, moonless, but above the fog very brilliant with stars. On a little mound near our tents, we collected and looked over the rolling white seas of fog. Out of it rose tent peaks and tall spires of melting smoke, which became luminous underneath when the flames licked higher into the clean air, as if driven by the noises of the unseen army. Old Audi Ibn Zuwaid corrected me gravely when I said this to him, telling me, It is not an army, it is a world which is moving on Wedge. I rejoiced at his insistence, for it had been to create this very feeling that we had hampered ourselves with an unwieldy crowd of men on so difficult a march. Then, without warning or parade, Sharif Nasir of Medina came in. Faisal leaped up, embraced him, and led him over to us. Nasir made a splendid impression, much as we had heard, and much as we were expecting of him. He was the opener of roads, the forerunner of Faisal's movement, the man who had fired his first shot in Medina, and who was to fire our last shot at Muslimiya beyond Aleppo, on the day that Turkey asked for an armistice. And from beginning to end, all that could be told of him was good. He was a man of gardens, whose lot had been unwilling war since boyhood. He was now about twenty-seven. His low, broad forehead matched his sensitive eyes, while his weak, pleasant mouth and small chin were clearly seen through a clipped black beard. We slept late the following day, to brace ourselves for the necessary hours of talk. Faisal carried most of this upon his own shoulders. Nasir supported him as second in command, and the Bedawi brothers sat by to help. The day was bright and warm, threatening to be hot later, and Newcomb and I wandered about looking at the watering, the men, and the constant affluence of newcomers. We were already two days behind our promise to the Navy, and Newcomb decided to ride ahead this night to Haban. There, he would meet Boyle and explain that we must fail the Harding at the rendezvous, but would be glad if she could return there on the evening of January the 24th, when we should arrive much in need of water. He would also see if the naval attack could not be delayed till the 25th to preserve the joint scheme. In the morning, early, we marched in a straggle for three hours down Wadi Hamd. Then the valley went to the left, and we struck out across a hollow, desolate, featureless region. Today was cold. A hard north wind drove into our faces down the grey coast. As we marched, we heard intermittent heavy firing from the direction of Wej, and feared that the Navy had lost patience and were acting without us. However, we could not make up the days we had wasted, so we pushed on for the whole dull stage, crossing affluent after affluent of Hamd. The plain was striped with these wadis, all shallow and straight and bare, as many and as intricate as the veins in a leaf. At last, we re-entered Hamd at Kurna, and though its clay bottoms held only mud, decided to camp. While we were settling in, there was a sudden rush. Camels had been seen pasturing away to the east, and the energetic of the Johanna streamed out, captured them, and drove them in. Faisal was furious and shouted to them to stop, but they were too excited to hear him. He snatched his rifle and shot at the nearest man, who in fear tumbled out of his saddle so that the others checked their course. Faisal had them up before him, laid about the principals with his camel stick, and impounded the stolen camels and those of the thieves till the whole tally was complete. Then he handed the beast back to their billy owners. Had he not done so, it would have involved a private war with the local people, our allies of the morrow, and might have checked extension beyond Wedge. Our success lay in bond to such trifles. Next morning, we made for the beach and up at Tahaban at four o'clock. The Harding was duly there to our relief and landing water, although the shallow bay gave little shelter and the rough sea rolling in made boat work hazardous. We reserved first call for the mules and gave what water was left to the more thirsty of the footmen, but it was a difficult night, and crowds of suffering men lingered jostling about the tanks in the rays of the searchlight, hoping for another drink if the sailors should venture in again. 
I went on board and heard that the naval attack had been carried out as though the land army were present, since Boyle feared that the Turks would run away if he waited. As a matter of fact, the day we reached Abu Zarabat, Ahmed Tufik Bey, Turkish governor, had addressed the garrison, saying that Wej must be held to the last drop of blood. Then at dusk, he had got onto his camel and ridden off to the railway, with the few mounted men fit for flight. The two hundred infantry determined to do his abandoned duty against the landing party, but they were outnumbered three to one, and the naval gunfire was too heavy to let them make proper use of their positions. So far as the Harding knew, the fighting was not ended, but Wage Town had been occupied by seamen and Arabs. Profitable rumors excited the army, which began to trickle off northward soon after midnight. At dawn, we rallied the various contingents and advanced in order, meeting a few scattered Turks, of whom one party put up a short resistance. The Aguil dismounted to strip off their cloaks, headcloths, and shirts, and went on in brown half-nakedness, which they said would ensure clean wounds if they were hit. Also, their precious clothes would not be damaged. It was pretty to look at the neat brown men in the sunlit sandy valley, with the turquoise pool of salt water in the midst to set off the crimson banners, which two standard bearers carried in the van. They went along in a steady lope, covering the ground at nearly six miles an hour, dead silent, and reached and climbed the ridge without a shot fired, so we knew the work had been finished for us by the Navy and its landing parties. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of Revolt in the Desert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter Six Tactics and Politics. In Cairo, the yet hot authorities promise gold, rifles, mules, more machine guns, and mountain guns. But these last, of course, we never got. The gun question was an eternal torment. It was maddening to be unequal to many enterprises and to fail in others, for the technical reason that we could not keep down the Turkish artillery, because its guns outranged ours by three or four thousand yards. We received a great reinforcement to our cause in Ja'afar Pasha, a Baghdadi officer from the Turkish army. After distinguished service in the German and Turkish armies, he had been chosen by Enver to organize the levies of the Sheikh el Senussi. He went there by submarine, made a decent force of the wild men, and showed tactical ability against the British in two battles. Then he was captured and lodged in the citadel at Cairo with the other officer prisoners of war. He escaped one night, slipping down a blanket rope towards the moat. But the blankets failed under the strain, and in the fall he hurt his ankle, and was retaken, helpless. In hospital he gave his parole and was enlarged after paying for the torn blanket. But one day he read in an Arabic newspaper of the Sharif's revolt, and of the execution by the Turks of prominent Arab nationalists, his friends, and realized that he had been on the wrong side. Faisal had heard of him, of course, and wanted him as commander-in-chief of his regular troops, whose improvement was now our main effort. In Cairo were Hogarth and George Lloyd, Storrs and Didas, and many old friends. Beyond them, the circle of Arabian well-wishers was now strangely increased. Sir Archibald Murray realized with a sudden shock that more Turkish troops were fighting the Arabs than were fighting him, and began to remember how he had always favored the Arab revolt. Admiral Weymouth was as ready to help now as he had been in our hard days around Rabig. Sir Reginald Wingate, High Commissioner in Egypt, was happy in the success of the work he had advocated for years. I grudged him this happiness, for McMahon, who took the actual risk of starting it, had been broken just before prosperity began. 
I returned to Wedge, where life was interesting. We had now set our camp in order. Faisal pitched his tents, here an opulent group, living tents, reception tents, staff tents, guest tents, servants. About a mile from the sea, on the edge of the coral shelf which ran up gently from the beach, till it ended in a steep drop facing east and south over broad valleys, radiating star-like from the landlocked harbour. The tents of soldiers and tribesmen were grouped in these sandy valleys, leaving the chill height for ourselves, and very delightful in the evening we northerners found it, when the breeze from the sea carried us a murmur of the waves, faint and far off, like the echo of traffic up a by-street in London. Immediately beneath us were the Agil, an irregular close group of tents. South of these were Rasim's artillery, and by him for company, Abdullah's machine gunners, in regular lines, with their animals picketed out in those formal rows, which were incense to the professional officer, and convenient if space were precious. Further out, the market was set plainly on the ground, a boiling swell of men always about the goods. The scattered tents and shelters of the tribesmen filled each gully or windless place. Beyond the last of them lay open country, with camel parties coming in and out by the straggling palms of the nearest, too brackish well. As background were the foothills, reefs, and clusters, like ruined castles, thrown up craggily to the horizon of the coastal range. As it was the custom in Wedge to camp wide apart, very wide apart, my life was spent in moving back and forth to Faisal's tents, to the English tents, to the Egyptian army tents, to the town, the port, the wireless station, tramping all day restlessly up and down these coral paths in sandals or barefoot, hardening my feet, getting by slow degrees the power to walk with little pain over sharp and burning ground, tempering my already trained body for greater endeavor. Poor Arabs wondered why I had no mare, and I forbore to puzzle them by incomprehensible talk of hardening myself, or confess that I would rather walk than ride, for sparing of animals. Yet the first was true, and the second true. Something hurtful to my pride, disagreeable, rose at the sight of these lower forms of life. Their existence struck a servile reflection upon our human kind, the style in which a god would look on us, and to make use of them, to lie under an avoidable obligation to them, seemed to me shameful. It was as with the Negroes, Tom-Tom playing themselves to red madness each night under the ridge. Their faces, being clearly different from our own, were tolerable. But it hurt that they should possess exact counterparts of all our bodies. Faisal, within, labored day and night at his politics, in which so few of us could help. Outside, the crowd employed and diverted us with parades, joy-shooting, and marches of victory. Also, there were accidents. Once a group playing behind our tents, set off a seaplane bomb, dud relic of Boyle's capture of the town. In the explosion, their limbs were scattered about the camp, marking the canvas with red splashes, which soon turned a dull brown and then faded pale. Faisal had the tents changed and ordered the bloody ones to be destroyed. The frugal slaves washed them. Another day, a tent took fire and part roasted three of our guests. The camp crowded round and roared with laughter till the fire died down. And then, rather shamefacedly, we cared for their hurts. The third day, a mare was wounded by a falling joy bullet, and many tents were pierced. One night, the Agil mutinied against their commandant, Ibn Dakil, for fining them too generally and flogging them too severely. They rushed his tent, howling and shooting, threw his things about and beat his servants. That not being enough to blunt their fury, they began to remember Yembo and went off to kill the Atiba. Faisal, from our bluff, saw their torches and ran barefoot amongst them, 
laying on with the flat of his sword like four men. His fury delayed them while the slaves and horsemen, calling for help, dashed downhill with rushes and shouts and blows of sheathed swords. One gave him a horse on which he charged down the ringleaders, while we dispersed groups by firing very lights into their clothing. Only two were killed and thirty wounded. Ibn Dakil resigned next day. Fakri Pasha was still playing our game. He held an entrenched line around Medina, just far enough out to make it impossible for the Arabs to shell the city. Such an attempt was never made or imagined. The other troops were being distributed along the railway, in strong garrisons at all water stations between Medina and Tabuk, and in smaller posts between these garrisons, so that daily patrols might guarantee the track. In short, he had fallen back on as stupid a defensive as could be conceived. Garland had gone southeast from Wedge, and Newcomb northeast, to pick holes in it with high explosives. They would cut rails and bridges, and place automatic mines for running trains. The Arabs had passed from doubt to violent optimism, and were promising exemplary service. Faisal enrolled most of the Billy, who made him master of Arabia between the railway and the sea. He then sent the Juhayna to Abdullah in Wadi Ais. He could now prepare to deal solemnly with the Hejaz railway. But I begged him first to delay in Wej and set marching an intense movement among the tribes beyond us, that in the future our revolt might be extended and the railway threatened from Tabuk, our present limit of influence, northward as far as Maan. With his northern neighbors, the coastal Hawetat, he had already made a beginning, but we now sent to the Benietie, a stronger people to the northeast. The chief Asi ibn Atiye came in and swore allegiance. He gave us freedom of movement across his tribe's territory. Beyond lay various tribes owning obedience to Nuri Sha'alan, the great emir of the Ru'ala, who after the Sharif and Ibn Sa'd and Ibn Rashid was the fourth figure among the precarious princes of the desert. Nuri was an old man who had ruled his Anaze tribesmen for thirty years. His was the chief family of the Ru'ala. But Nuri had no precedence among them at birth, nor was he loved, nor a great man of battle. His headship had been acquired by sheer force of character. To gain it, he had killed two of his brothers. Later, he had added Shararat and others to the number of his followers. And in all their desert, his word was absolute law. He had none of the wheedling diplomacy of the ordinary sheikh. A word, and there was an end of opposition. Or of his opponent. All feared and obeyed him. To use his roads we must have his countenance. Fortunately this was easy. Faisal had secured it years ago and had retained it by interchange of gifts from Medina and Yembo. Now from Wej, Faiz al Gusain went up to him and on the way crossed Ibn Dugmi, one of the chief men of the Ru'ala, coming down to us with the desirable gift of some hundreds of good baggage camels. Nuri, of course, still kept friendly with the Turks. Damascus and Baghdad were his markets, and they could have half-starved his tribe in three months had they suspected him. But we knew that when the moment came, we should have his armed help, and till then anything short of a breach with Turkey. His favor would open to us the Sirhan, a famous roadway, camping ground, and chain of water holes, which in a series of linked depressions extended from Jauf, Nori's capital in the southeast, northwards to Azraq, near Jebel Druze in Syria. It was the freedom of the Sirhan we needed to reach the tents of the eastern Hawitat, those famous Abu Taye, of whom Auda, the greatest fighting man in northern Arabia, was chief. Only by means of Auda Abu Taye could we swing the tribes from Ma'an to Aqaba so violently in our favor that they would help us take Aqaba and its hills from their Turkish garrisons. Only with his active support could we venture to thrust out from Wej on the long trek to Man. Since our Yembo days, we had been longing for him and trying to win him to our cause. We made a great step forward at Wej. Ibn Za'al, his cousin and a war leader of the Abu Taye, 
arrived on the 17th of February, which was in all respects a fortunate day. At dawn, there came in five chief men of the Shararat from the desert east of Tabuk, bringing a present of eggs of the Arabian ostrich, plentiful in their little frequented desert. After them, the slaves showed in Daif Allah, Abu Tir, a cousin of Habd ibn Jazi, paramount of the central Hawitat of the Ma'an Plateau. These were numerous and powerful, splendid fighters, but blood enemies of their cousins, the nomad Abu Tayyi, because of an old grounded quarrel between Auda and Hamd. We were proud to see them coming thus far to greet us, yet not content, for they were less fit than the Abu Tayyi for our purposed attack against Aqaba. On their heels came a cousin of Nawaf, Nuri Sha'alan's eldest son, with a mare sent by Nawaf to Faisal. The Sha'alan and the Jazi, being hostile, hardened eyes at one another. So we divided the parties and improvised a new guest camp. After the Ru'ala was announced the Abu Tagega chief of the sedentary Hawatat of the coast. He brought his tribe's respectful homage and the spoils of Daba and Moweli, the last two Turkish outlets on the Red Sea. Room was made for him on Faisal's carpet, and the warmest thanks rendered him for his tribe's activity, which carried us to the borders of Aqaba, by tracks too rough for operations of force, but convenient for preaching, and still more so for getting news. In the afternoon, Ibn Zal arrived, with ten other of Auda's chief followers. He kissed Faisal's hand once for Auda, and then once for himself, and sitting back declared that he came from Auda to present his salutations, and to ask for orders. Faisal, with policy, controlled his outward joy, and introduced him gravely to his blood enemies, the Jazi Hawatat. Ibn Zal acknowledged them distantly. Later, we held great private conversations with him and dismissed him with rich gifts, richer promises, and Faisal's own message to Auda that his mind would not be smooth till he had seen him face to face in Wej. Auda was an immense, chivalrous name, but an unknown quantity to us, and in so vital a matter as Aqaba, we could not afford a mistake. He must come down that we might weigh him and frame our future plans actually in his presence and with his help. When the sun had declined across the sea and the cool of evening drew down, a great cavalcade issued from the ridges masking Abu Zarebat and closed on us. Forth from its front at wild speed shot three or four mounted specks, crossing each other's in their own tracks in mimic battle, while the main body began to chant a deep Ataba melody. This was Sharif Shakir, my astonishment of Jeddah, coming attended to visit Faisal from Sharif Abdullah's camp at Wadi Ais, near Medina. Shakir was a prince in the eyes of the great Atiba tribe, to whom his riding, the man was a very centaur on horseback, his shooting, his bravery, his recklessness, his wealth, were alike wonderful. In return, Shakir played the Badawi. His simple clothes, simple living, his arts and manners were all nomadic. Even his appearance, from the horny feet to the braided hair, and the hair was Bedouin also in its population. Only a niggard, laughed Shakir, would want his whole head to himself. Except that all its events were happy, this day was not essentially unlike Faisal's every day. The rush of news made my diary fat. The roads to Wej swarmed with envoys and volunteers and great sheikhs riding in to swear allegiance. The contagion of their constant passage made the lukewarm billy even more profitable to us. Faisal swore new adherence, solemnly, on the Quran between his hands, to wait while he waited, march when he marched, to yield obedience to no Turk, to deal kindly with all who spoke Arabic, whether Baghdadi, Aleppine, Syrian, or pure-blooded, and to put independence above life, family, and goods. He also began to confront them at once, in his presence, with their tribal enemies, and to compose their feuds. 
an account of profit and loss would be struck between the parties, with Faisal modulating and interceding between them, and often paying the balance, or contributing towards it from his own funds, to hurry on the pact. During two years, Faisal so labored daily, putting together and arranging in their natural order the innumerable tiny pieces which made up Arabian society, and combining them into his one design of war against the Turks. There was no blood feud left active in any of the districts through which he had passed, and he was court of appeal, ultimate and unchallenged, for Western Arabia. He showed himself worthy of this achievement. He never gave a partial decision, nor a decision so impracticably just that it must lead to disorder. No Arab ever impugned his judgments or questioned his wisdom and competence in tribal business. By patiently sifting out right and wrong, by his tact, his wonderful memory, he gained authority over the nomads from Medina to Damascus and beyond. He was recognized as a force transcending tribe, superseding blood chiefs, greater than jealousies. The Arab movement became in the best sense national, since within it all Arabs were at one, and for it private interests must be set aside. And in this movement, chief place by right of application and by right of ability, had been properly earned by the man who had filled it for those few weeks of triumph and longer months of disillusion, after Damascus had been set free. The Bedou were odd people. For an Englishman, sojourning with them was unsatisfactory unless he had patience wide and deep as the sea. They were absolute slaves of their appetite, with no stamina of mind, drunkards for coffee, milk, or water, gluttons for stewed meat, shameless beggars of tobacco. They dreamed for weeks before and after their rare sexual exercises, and spent the intervening days titillating themselves and their hearers with body tales. Had the circumstances of their lives given them opportunity, they would have been sheer sensualists. Their strength was the strength of men geographically beyond temptation. The poverty of Arabia made them simple, continent, enduring. If forced into civilized life, they would have succumbed like any savage race to its diseases. Meanness, luxury, cruelty, crooked dealing, artifice, and like savages, they would have suffered them exaggeratedly for lack of inoculation. If they suspected that we wanted to drive them, either they were mulish or they went away. If we comprehended them and gave time and trouble to make things tempting to them, then they would go to great pains for our pleasure. Whether the results achieved were worth the effort, no man could tell. Englishmen, accustomed to greater returns, would not, and indeed could not, have spent the time, thought, and tact lavished every day by sheikhs and emirs for such meager ends. Arab processes were clear. Arab minds moved logically as our own, with nothing radically incomprehensible or different, except the premises. There was no excuse or reason, except our laziness and ignorance, whereby we could call them inscrutable or oriental, or leave them misunderstood. Militarily, we were now firmly assured in Wege. Allenby sent us down two Rolls-Royce armored cars, veterans of General Smut's campaign in German East Africa. Their officers and crews were English and enterprising. They began to learn the arts of sand driving. Yembo was emptied of its last soldiers and stores. Rabig also was being abandoned. The airplanes from it had flown up here and were established. Their Egyptian troops had been shipped after them, with Joyce and Goslid and the Rabig staff, who were now in charge of things at Wej. Newcomb and Hornby were up country, tearing at the railway day and night, almost with their own hands. All seemed already for the best, when one afternoon, Suleiman, the guest master, hurried in and whispered to Faisal, who turned to me with shining eyes, trying to be calm, and said, Auda is here. I shouted, Auda Abu Tayi? And at that moment, the tent flap was drawn back before a deep voice which boomed salutations to our Lord, the commander of the faithful. There entered a tall, strong figure with a haggard face, 
passionate and tragic. This was Auda, and after him followed Muhammad, his son, a child in looks and only eleven years old in truth. Faisal had sprung to his feet. Auda caught his hand and kissed it, and they drew aside a pace or two and looked at each other. A splendid, unlike pair, typical of much that was best in Arabia, Faisal the prophet and Auda the warrior, each filling his part to perfection and immediately understanding and liking the other. They sat down. Faisal introduced us one by one, and Auda with a measured word seemed to register each person. We had heard much of Auda and were banking to open Aqaba with his help, and after a moment I knew, from the force and directness of the man, that we would attain our end. He had come down to us like a knight errant, chafing at our delay in Wej, anxious only to be acquiring merit for Arab freedom in his own lands. If his performance was one half his desire, we should be prosperous and fortunate. The weight was off all minds before we went to supper. We were a cheerful party, Nasib, Faiz, Muhammad al Dalan, Auda's politic cousin, Zal, his nephew, and Sharif Nasir, resting in Wej for a few days between expeditions. I told Faisal odd stories of Abdullah's camp and the joy of breaking railways. Suddenly, Auda scrambled to his feet with a loud God forbid and flung from the tent. We stared at one another, and there came a noise of hammering outside. I went after to learn what it meant, and there was Auda bent over a rock, pounding his false teeth to fragments with a stone. I had forgotten, he explained. Jemal Pasha gave me these. I was eating my lord's bread with Turkish teeth. Unfortunately, he had few teeth of his own, so that henceforward, eating the meat he loved was difficulty and after pain, and he went about half-nourished till we had taken Aqaba, and Sir Reginald Wingate sent him a dentist from Egypt to make an allied set. Auda was very simply dressed, northern fashion, in white cotton with a red Mosul headcloth. He might be over fifty, and his black hair was streaked with white, but he was still strong and straight, loosely built, spare, and as active as a much younger man. His face was magnificent in its lines and hollows. On it was written how truly the death and battle of Anad, his favorite son, cast sorrow over all his life when it ended his dream of handing on to future generations the greatness of the name of Abu Tayyi. He had large, eloquent eyes, like black velvet in richness. His forehead was low and broad, his nose very high and sharp, powerfully hooked his mouth rather large and mobile. His beard and mustaches had been trimmed to a point in Hawitat style, with the lower jaw shaven underneath. Centuries ago, the Hawitat came from Hajaz and their nomad clans prided themselves on being true Bedu. Auda was their master type. His hospitality was sweeping, except to very hungry souls, inconvenient. His generosity kept him always poor, despite the profits of a hundred raids. He had married twenty-eight times, had been wounded thirteen times, whilst the battles he provoked had seen all his tribesmen hurt and most of his relations killed. He himself had slain seventy-five men, Arabs, with his own hand in battle, and never a man except in battle. Of the number of dead Turks he could give no account. They did not enter the register. His Taweha under him had become the first fighters of the desert, with a tradition of desperate courage, a sense of superiority which never left them while there was life and work to do, but which had reduced them from 1,200 men to less than 500 in 30 years as the standard of nomadic fighting rose. Auda raided as often as he had opportunity, and as widely as he could. He had seen Aleppo, Basra, Wej, and Wadi Dawasir on his expeditions, and was careful to be at enmity with nearly all tribes in the desert that he might have proper scope for raids. After his robber fashion, he was as hard-headed as he was hot-headed, and in his maddest exploits there would be a cold factor of possibility to lead him through. His patience in action was extreme, and he received and ignored advice, 
criticism, or abuse with a smile as constant as it was very charming. If he got angry, his face worked uncontrollably, and he burst into a fit of shaking passion, only to be assuaged after he had killed. At such times, he was a wild beast, and men escaped his presence. Nothing on earth would make him change his mind, or obey an order, or do the least thing he disapproved, and he took no heed of men's feelings when his face was set. He saw life as a saga. All the events in it were significant, all personages in contact with him heroic. His mind was stored with poems of old raids and epic tales of fights, and he overflowed with them on the nearest listener. If he lacked listeners, he would very likely sing them to himself in his tremendous voice, deep and resonant and loud. He had no control over his lips, and was therefore terrible to his own interests and hurt his friends continually. He spoke of himself in the third person, and was so sure of his fame that he loved to shout out stories against himself. At times, he seemed taken by a demon of mischief, and in public assembly would invent and utter on oath appalling tales of the private life of his hosts or guests. And yet with all this he was modest, as simple as a child, direct, honest, kind-hearted, and warmly loved, even by those to whom he was most embarrassing, his friends. The long pause after Wedge fell had an important effect on my mind, for I was sent on detached duty and had solitude for thinking, in a remote point from which to regard our activities. Every effort was still directed against the railway. Newcomb and Garland were near Mouadam, with Sharif Sharaf and Maouloud. They had many Billy, the mule-mounted infantry, and guns, and machine guns, and hoped to take the fort and railway station there. Newcomb meant them to move all Faisal's men forward very close to Madey and Sali, and by taking and holding a part of the line, to cut off Medina and compel its early surrender. Wilson was coming up to help in this operation, and Davenport would take as many of the Egyptian army as he could transport to reinforce the Arab attack. All this program was what I had believed necessary for the further progress of the Arab revolt when we took Wedge. I had planned and arranged some of it myself. But now, to my leisure, it seemed that not merely the details, but the essence of this plan were wrong. It therefore became my business to explain my changed ideas, and if possible, to persuade my chiefs to follow me into the new theory. So I began with three propositions. Firstly, that irregulars would not attack places, and so remained incapable of forcing a decision. Secondly, that they were as unable to defend a line or point as they were to attack it. Thirdly, that their virtue lay in depth, not in face. The Arab war was geographical, and the Turkish army an accident. Our aim was to seek the enemy's weakest material link, and bear only on that till time made their whole length fail. Our largest resources, the Bedouin on whom our war must be built, were unused to formal operations, but had assets of mobility, toughness, self-assurance, knowledge of the country, intelligent courage. With them, dispersal was strength. Consequently, we must extend our front to its maximum, to impose on the Turks the longest possible passive defense, since that was, materially, their most costly form of war. Our duty was to attain our end with the greatest economy of life, since life was more precious to us than money or time. If we were patient and superhuman skilled, we could follow the direction of Saxe and reach victory without battle, by pressing our advantages, mathematical and psychological. Fortunately, our physical weakness was not such as to demand this. We were richer than the Turks in transport, machine guns, cars, high explosive. We could develop a highly mobile, highly equipped striking force of the smallest size and use it successively at distributed points of the Turkish line to make them strengthen their posts beyond a defensive minimum of 20 men. This would be a shortcut to success. We must not take Medina. The Turk was harmless there. In prison in Egypt, he would cost us food and guards. We wanted him to stay at Medina and every other distant place, 
in the largest numbers. Our ideal was to keep his railway just working, but only just, with the maximum of loss and discomfort. The factor of food would confine him to the railways, but he was welcome to the Hejaz Railway and the Transjordan Railway and the Palestine and Syrian Railways for the duration of the war, so long as he gave us the other 999 thousandths of the Arab world. If he tended to evacuate too soon, as a step to concentrating in the small area which his numbers could dominate effectually, then we should have to restore his confidence by reducing our enterprises against him. His stupidity would be our ally, for he would like to hold, or to think he held, as much of his old provinces as possible. This pride in his imperial heritage would keep him in his present absurd position, all flanks and no front. In detail, I criticized the ruling scheme. To hold a middle point of the railway would be expensive, for the holding force might be threatened from each side. The mixture of Egyptian troops with tribesmen was a moral weakness. If there were professional soldiers present, the Bedouin would stand aside and watch them work, glad to be excused the leading part. Jealousy, superadded to inefficiency, would be the outcome. Further, the Billy country was very dry, and the maintenance of a large force up by the line technically difficult. Neither my general reasoning, however, nor my particular objections had much weight. The plans were made, and the preparations advanced. Everyone was too busy with his own work to give me specific authority to launch out on mine. All I gained was a hearing, and a qualified admission that my counter-offensive might be a useful diversion. I was working out with Auda Abu Tayyi, a march to the Hawatat in their spring pastures of the Syrian desert. From them, we might raise a mobile camel force and rush Aqaba from the eastward, without guns or machine guns. The eastern was the unguarded side, the line of least resistance, the easiest for us. Our march would be an extreme example of a turning movement, since it involved a desert journey of 600 miles to capture a trench within gunfire of our ships. But there was no practicable alternative. Auda thought all things possible, with dynamite and money, and that the smaller clans about Aqaba would join us. Faisal, who was already in touch with them, also believed that they would help if we won a preliminary success up by Ma'an, and then moved in force against the port. The navy raided it while we were thinking, and their captured Turks gave us such useful information that I became eager to go off at once. End of chapter 6《Chapter 7 of Revolt in the Desert》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence • Chapter 7 — Setting Out for Syria By May the 9th, 1917, all things were ready, and in the glare of mid-afternoon, we left Faisal's tent, his good wishes sounding after us from the hilltop as we marched away. Sharif Nasir led us. His lucent goodness made him the only leader and a benediction for forlorn hopes. Our short stage was to the ford at Sabail, inland Wej, where the Egyptian pilgrims used to water. We camped by their great brick tank, in shade of the fort's curtain wall, or of the palms, and put to rights the deficiencies which this first march had shown. Auda and his kinsmen were with us, also Nasib el Bekri, the politic Damascene, to represent Faisal to the villagers of Syria. Nasib had brains and position, and the character of a previous successful desert journey. His cheerful endurance of adventure, rare among Syrians, marked him out as our fellow as much as his political mind, his ability, his persuasive good-humoured eloquence, and the patriotism which often overcame his native passion for the indirect. Nasib chose Zeki, a Syrian officer, as his companion. For escort, we had thirty-five a gale, under Ibn de Gaithir, a man walled into his own temperament, 
remote, abstracted, self-sufficient. Faisal made up a purse of 20,000 pounds in gold, all he could afford and more than we asked for, to pay the wages of the new men we hoped to enroll, and to make such advances as should stimulate the Hawitat to swiftness. My Agil, Mukamer, Murhan, Ali, had been supplemented by Mohammed, a blowsy, obedient peasant boy from some village in Horan, and by Gassim, of Man, a fanged and yellow-faced outlaw who fled into the desert to the Hawitat after killing a Turkish official in a dispute over cattle tax. Crimes against tax-gatherers had a sympathetic aspect for all of us, and this gave Gassim a specious rumor of geniality, which actually was far from truth. After dark, we loaded up and started. Nasir, our guide, had grown to know this country nearly as well as he did his own. While we rode through the moonlit and starry night, his memory was dwelling very intimately about his home. He told me of their stone-paved house, whose sunk halls had vaulted roofs against the summer heat, and of the gardens planted with every kind of fruit tree, in shady paths about which they could walk at ease, mindless of the sun. He told me of the wheel over the well, with its machinery of leathern trip buckets, raised by oxen upon an inclined path of hard-trodden earth, and of how the water from its reservoir slid in concrete channels by the borders of the pass, or worked fountains in the court beside the great vine trellis swimming tank, lined with shining cement, within whose green depth he and his brother's household used to plunge at midday. Nasir, though usually merry, had a quick vein of suffering in him, and tonight he was wondering why he, an emir of Medina, rich and powerful and at rest in that garden palace, had thrown up all to become the weak leader of desperate adventures in the desert. For two years he had been outcast, always fighting beyond the front line of Faisal's armies, chosen for every particular hazard, the pioneer in each advance. And meanwhile the Turks were in his house, wasting his fruit trees and chopping down his palms. Even, he said, the great well which had sounded with the creak of the bullock wheels for six hundred years had fallen silent. The garden, cracked with heat, was becoming waste as the blind hills over which we rode. After four hours' march, we slept for two and rose with the sun. The baggage camels, weak with the cursed mange of Wej, moved slowly, grazing all day as they went. We riders, light-mounted, might have passed them easily. But Auda, who was regulating our marches, forbade, because of the difficulties in front, for which our animals would need all the fitness we could conserve in them. So we plodded soberly on for six hours in great heat. The summer sun in this country of white sand behind Wej could dazzle the eyes cruelly, and the bare rocks each side our path threw off waves of heat, which made our heads ache and swim. Consequently, by eleven of the forenoon, we were mutinous against Auda's wish still to hold on. So we halted and lay under trees till half-past two, each of us trying to make a solid though shifting shadow for himself by means of a doubled blanket caught across the thorns of overhanging boughs. We rode again after this break for three gentle hours over level bottoms, approaching the walls of a great valley, and found the green garden of Alcur lying just in front of us. White tents peeped from among the palms. While we dismounted, Rasim and Abdullah, Mahmoud the doctor, and even old Maulud, the cavalryman, came out to welcome us. They told us that Sharif Sharaf, whom we wished to meet at Abu Raga, our next stopping place, was away raiding for a few days. This meant that there was no hurry, so we made holiday at El Kur for two nights. The inhabitant of Kur, the only sedentary Baluwi, Hori Daif Allah, labored day and night with his daughters in the little terrace plot which he had received from his ancestors. It was built out of the south edge of the valley in a bay defended against flood by a massive wall of unhewn stone. 
in its midst opened the well of clear cold water above which stood a balanced cantilever of mud and rude poles by this daif allah morning and evening when the sun was low drew up great bowls of water and spilled them into clay runnels contrived through his garden among the tree roots he grew low palms for their spreading leaves shaded his plants from the sun which otherwise might in that stark valley wither them and raised young tobacco his most profitable crop with smaller plots of beans and melons cucumbers and eggplants in due season the old man lived with his women in a brushwood hut beside the well and was scornful of our politics demanding what more to eat or drink these sore efforts and bloody sacrifices would bring we gently teased him with notions of liberty with freedom of the arab countries for the arabs this garden daifala should it not be your very own however he would not understand but stood up to strike himself proudly on the chest crying i i am cur still we were grateful to him for beside that he showed an example of contentment to us slaves of a necessary appetite he sold vegetables and on them and on the tin bounty of Rasim and abdullah and mahmud we lived richly each evening round the fires they had music not the monotonous open-throated roaring of the tribes nor the exciting harmony of the agail but the falsetto quarter tones and trills of urban syria maulud had musicians in his unit and bashful soldiers were brought up each evening to play guitars and sing cafe songs of damascus or the love verses of their villages the soldier camp would grow dead silent till the stanza ended and then from every man would come a sighing longing echo of the last note only old daif allah went on splashing out his water sure that after we had finished with our silliness someone would yet need and buy his green stuff to townsmen this garden was a memory of the world before we went mad with war and drove ourselves into the desert to auda there was an indecency of exhibition in the plant richness and he longed for an empty view so we cut short our second night in paradise and at two in the morning went on up the valley it was pitch dark the very stars in the sky being unable to cast light into the depths where we were wandering Auda was guide, and to make us sure of him, he lifted up his voice in an interminable Ho, 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 song of the Hawitat, an epic chanted on three bass notes, up and down, back and forward, in so round a voice that the words were indistinguishable. After a little, we thanked him for the singing, since the path went away to the left, and our long line followed his turn by the echoes of his voice, rolling about the torn black cliffs in the moonlight. We marched until the early sun, very trying to those who had ridden all night, opposed us. Breakfast was off our own flour, thus lightening at last, after days of hospitality, our poor camel's food load. Sharaf, being not yet in Abu Raga, we made no more haste than water difficulties compelled, and after food, again put up our blanket roofs and lay till afternoon, fretfully dodging after their unstable shadow, getting moist with heat and the constant pricking of flies. In the morning, we rode at five. Our valley pinched together, and we went round a sharp spur, ascending steeply. The track became a bad goat path, zigzagging up a hillside too precipitous to climb except on all fours. We dropped off our camels and led them by the headstalls. Soon we had to help each other, a man urging the camels from behind, another pulling them from the front, encouraging them over the worst places, adjusting their loads to ease them. Parts of the track were dangerous, where rocks bulged out and narrowed it, so that the near half of the load grazed and forced the animals to the cliff edge. We had to repack the food and explosives, and in spite of all our care, lost two of our feeble camels in the pass. The Hawitat killed them where they lay broken, stabbing a keen dagger into the throat artery near the chest, while the neck was strained tight by pulling the head round to the saddle. 
They were at once cut up and shared out as meat. Then we came to the first break of surface, a sharp passage to the bottom of a shrub-grown sandy valley, on each side of which sandstone precipices and pinnacles, gradually growing in height as we went down, detached themselves sharply against the morning sky. We wound on, ever deeper into the earth until, half an hour later, by a sharp corner, we entered Wadi Jizl, a deep gorge some two hundred yards in width. Our camp was on some swelling dunes of weedy sand in an elbow of the valley, where a narrow cleft had set up a backwash and scooped out a basin in which a remnant of last winter's flood was caught. We sent a man for news up the valley to an oleander thicket where we saw the white peaks of Sharaf's tents. They expected him next day, so we passed two nights in this strange-colored echoing place. The brackish pool was fit for our camels, and in it we bathed at noon. Then we ate and slept generously, and wandered in the nearer valleys to see the horizontal stripes of pink and brown and cream and red which made up the general redness of the cliffs, delighting in the varied patterns of thin pencilings of lighter or darker tint, which were drawn over the plain body of rock. One afternoon, I spent behind some shepherd's fold of sandstone blocks, in warm soft air and sunlight, with a low burden of the wind plucking at the rough wall top above my head. The valley was instinct with peace and the wind's continuing noise made even it seem patient. My eyes were shut and I was dreaming, when a youthful voice made me see an anxious Ageli, a stranger, Daoud, squatting by me. He appealed for my compassion. His friend Faraj had burned their tent in a frolic, and Sa'ad, captain of Sharaf's Agil, was going to beat him in punishment. At my intercession he would be released. Sa'ad happened just then to visit me, and I put it to him, while Daoud sat watching us, his mouth slightly, eagerly open, his eyelids narrowed over large dark eyes, and his straight brows furrowed with anxiety. Daoud's pupils, set a little in front from the center of the eyeball, gave him an air of acute readiness. Sa'ad's reply was not comforting. The pair were always in trouble, and of late so outrageous in their tricks that Sharaf, the severe, had ordered an example to be made of them. All he could do for my sake was to let Daoud share the ordained sentence. Daoud leaped at the chance, kissed my hand and Saad's, and ran off up the valley. While Saad, laughing, told me stories of the famous pair. They were an instance of the eastern boy and boy affection which the segregation of women made inevitable. Such friendships often led to manly loves of a depth and force beyond our flesh-steeped conceit. When innocent, they were hot and unashamed. If sexuality entered, they passed into a give-and-take, unspiritual relation, like marriage. Next day, Sharaf did not come. Our morning passed with Auda talking of the march in front, while Nasir, with forefinger and thumb, flicked sputtering matches from the box across his tent at us. In the midst of our merriment, two bent figures, with pain in their eyes but crooked smiles upon their lips, hobbled up and saluted. These were Daoud, the hasty, and his love fellow, Faraj, a beautiful, soft-framed, girlish creature, with innocent, smooth face and swimming eyes. They said they were for my service. I had no need of them, and objected that after their beating they could not ride. They replied they had now come barebacked. I said I was a simple man who disliked servants about him. Dowd turned away, defeated and angry, but Faraj pleaded that we must have men, and they would follow me for company and out of gratitude. While the harder Dowd revolted, he went over to Nasir and knelt in appeal, all the women of him evident in his longing. At the end, on Nasir's advice, I took them both, mainly because they looked so young and clean. Sharaf delayed to come until the third morning. He had captured prisoners on the line and blown up rails in a culvert. One piece of his news was that in Wadi Dira'a, on our road, were pools of rainwater, new-fallen and sweet, 
this would shorten our waterless march to Fezzer by fifty miles. Next day, we left Abu Raga. Auda led us up a tributary valley, which soon widened into the plain of the Sheg, a sand flat. About it, in scattered confusion, sat small islands and pinnacles of red sandstone, grouped like seracs, wind eroded at the bases till they looked very fit to fall and block the road, which wound in and out between them through narrows seeming to give no passage, but always opening into another bay of blind alleys. Through this maze, Auda led unhesitatingly, digging along on his camel, elbows out, hands poised, swaying in the air by his shoulders. There were no footmarks on the ground, for each wind swept like a great brush over the sand surface, stippling the traces of the last travelers till the surface was again a pattern of innumerable tiny virgin waves. Only the dried camel droppings, which were lighter than the sand and rounded like walnuts, escaped over its ripples. They rolled about to be heaped in corners by the skirling winds. It was perhaps by them, as much as by his unrivaled road sense, that Auda knew the way. In the mid-march, we perceived five or six riders coming from the railway. I was in front with Auda, and we had that delicious thrill, friend or enemy, of meeting strangers in the desert, whilst we circumspectly drew across the vantage side, which kept the rifle arm free for a snap shot. But when they came nearer, we saw that they were of the Arab forces, the first riding loosely on a hulking camel, with the unwieldy Manchester-made timber saddle of the British Camel Corps, was a fair-haired, shaggy, bearded Englishman in tattered uniform. This, we guess, must be Hornby, Newcomb's pupil, the wild engineer who vied with him in smashing the railway. After we had exchanged greetings on this our first meeting, he told me that Newcomb had lately gone to Wedge to talk over his difficulties with Faisal and make fresh plans to meet them. At sunset, we reached the northern limit of the ruined sandstone land and rode up to a new level, sixty feet higher than the old, blue-black and volcanic, with a scattered covering of worn basalt blocks, small as a man's hand, neatly bedded like cobble paving over a floor of fine, hard black cinder, debris of themselves. It was very dark, a pure night enough, but the black stone underfoot swallowed the light of the stars, and at seven o'clock, when at last we halted, only four of our party were with us. We had reached a gentle valley, with a yet damp, soft, sandy bed, full of thorny brushwood, unhappily useless as camel food. We ran about tearing up these bitter bushes by the roots and heaping them in a great pyre, which Auda lit. When the fire grew hot, a long black snake wormed slowly out into our group. We must have gathered it, torpid with the twigs. The flames went shining across the dark flat, a beacon to the heavy camels which had lagged so much today that it was two hours before the last group arrived, the men singing their loudest, partly to encourage themselves and their hungry animals over the ghostly plain, partly so that we might know them friends. In the night, some of our camels strayed and our people had to go looking for them. So long that it was nearly eight o'clock, and we had baked bread and eaten before again we started. Our track lay across more lava field, but to our morning strength, the stones seemed rarer, and waves or hard surfaces of laid sand often drowned them smoothly, with covering as good to march on as a tennis court. We marched steadily till noon, and then sat out on the bare ground till three. An uneasy halt made necessary by our fear that the dejected camels, so long accustomed only to the sandy tracks of the coastal plain, might have their soft feet scorched by the sun-baked stones and go lame with us on the road. After we mounted, the going became worse and we had continually to avoid large fields of piled basalt or deep yellow watercourses which cut through the crust into the soft stone beneath. After a while, red sandstone again cropped out in crazy chimneys from which the harder layers projected knife-sharp 
in level shelves beyond the soft crumbling rock. At last, these sandstone ruins became plentiful in the manner of yesterday, and stood grouped about our road in similar checkered yards of light and shade. Again we marveled at the sureness with which Auda guided our little party through the mazy rocks. They passed, and we re-entered volcanic ground. Little pimply craters stood about, often two or three together, and from them spines of high broken basalt led down like disordered causeways. Between craters the basalt was strewn in small tetrahedra, with angles rubbed and rounded, stone tight to stone like tesserae, upon a bed of pink-yellow mud. The ways worn across such flats by the constant passage of camels were very evident, since the slouching tread had pushed the blocks to each side of the path, and the thin mud of wet weather had run into these hollows and now inlaid them palely against the blue. Less used roads for hundreds of yards were like narrow ladders across the stone fields, for the tread of each foot was filled in with clean yellow mud, and ridges or bars of the blue-gray stone remained between each stepping place. After a stretch of such stone laying would be a field of jet-black basalt cinders, firm as concrete in the sun-baked mud, and afterwards a valley of soft black sand, with more crags of weathered sandstone rising from the blackness, or from waves of the wind-blown red and yellow grains of their own decay. At last Auda pointed ahead to a fifty-foot ridge of large twisted blocks, lying coursed one upon the other as they had writhed and shrunk in their cooling. There was the limit of lava, and he and I rode on together, and saw in front of us an open rolling plain, Wadi Aish, a fine scrub in golden sand, with green bushes scattered here and there. It held a very little water, in holes which someone had scooped after the rainstorm of three weeks ago. We camped by them, and drove our unladen camels out till sunset, to graze for the first adequate time since Abu Raga. While they were scattered over the land, mounted men appeared on the horizon to the east, making towards the water. They came on too quickly, to be honest, and fired at our herdsmen. But the rest of us ran at once upon the scattered reefs and knolls, shooting or shouting. Hearing us so many, they drew off as fast as their camels would go, and from the ridge in the dusk we saw them, a bare dozen in all, scampering away towards the line. We were glad to see them avoid us so thoroughly. Auda thought they were a Shamar patrol. End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of Revolt in the Desert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter 8 The Veritable Desert. At dawn, we saddled up for the short stage to Deir a a the water pools of which Sharaf had told us. We halted there till afternoon, for we were now quite near the railway, and had to drink our stomachs full and fill our few water skins, ready for the long dash to Fezur. In the halt, Auda came to see Faraj and Daoud dressed my camel with butter for relief against the intolerable itch of mange which had broken out recently on its face. The dry pasturage of the Billy country and the infected ground of Wedge had played havoc with our beasts. In all Faisal's stud of riding camels, there was not one healthy. In our little expedition, every camel was weakening daily. Nasir was full of anxiety, lest many break down in the forced march before us and leave their riders stranded in the desert. We had no medicines for mange and could do little for it in spite of our need. However, the rubbing and anointing did make my animal more comfortable, and we repeated it as often as Faraj or Daoud could find butter in our party. These two boys were giving me great satisfaction. They were brave and cheerful, active, good riders and willing workmen. By a quarter to four, 
we were in the saddle, going down Wadi Dira'a into steep and high ridges of shifting sand, sometimes with a cap of harsh red rock jutting from them. After a while, three or four of us, in advance of the main body, climbed a sand peak on hands and knees to spy out the railway. There was no air, and the exercise was more than we required. But our reward was immediate, for the line showed itself quiet and deserted looking. We were to have an unmolested crossing. Our heavy camels marched over the valley, the line, and the further flat, till sheltered in the sand and rock mouths of the country beyond the railway. Meanwhile, the Agael fixed gun cotton or gelatin charges to as many of the rails as we had time to reach, and began, in proper order, to light the fuses, filling the hollow valley with the echoes of repeated bursts. Auda had not before known dynamite, and with a child's first pleasure was moved to a rush of hasty poetry on its powerful glory. We cut three telegraph wires and fastened the free ends to the saddles of six riding camels of the Hawetat. The astonished team struggled far into the eastern valleys with the growing weight of twanging, tangling wire and the bursting poles dragging after them. At last, they could no longer move, so we cut them loose and rode in the falling dusk, laughing after the caravan. In the morning, Auda had us afoot before four, going uphill 